Today on the channel, we are taking a mega look at some of our favorite tech from the past. From $250 dual screen smartphones to forgotten PlayStations and some of the most iconic gadgets, we have nearly three hours of fun retrospectives. So grab a bag of popcorn, relax, and let's jump right in, starting with a good old classic. This is an iPod, and probably one of the best ones Apple ever made. I want to talk about what made this particular one so good, and it's also pretty beat up. So I'll be getting my hands dirty, making it as good as new, and even modding it to make it better than ever before. I might be biased because I grew up in the 2000s, but there aren't many pieces of tech that truly left a cultural mark on the world as much as the iPod. Beyond the flashy TV ads, and huge billboards, especially living in New York City at the time, it was hard to walk 10 feet without seeing those white earbuds in someone's ear. They didn't look like a nerdy tech product like other MP3 players of the time. iPods were the definition of trendy and cool. Coming off the heels of CDs, the idea that you can stow hundreds of albums in a device smaller than a bifold wallet was a big deal, especially being in middle school school with the power of DSL and LimeWire on my side, my excitement was through the roof when I finally got one for Christmas. Back then, I had way more music than what I could realistically listen to, and having access to it whenever I wanted was an amazing feeling. Now, the iPod we're focusing on for this video is the 5.5 generation classic, which is highly regarded as one of the best ones Apple has ever made, and also happens to be the one that I grew up with. Not only did it have a beautiful 2.5 inch color LCD display, but it also let you play videos as well. Mine had a whole two seasons of Futurama on it, which I actually still own on iTunes. But most importantly for you audiophiles, the 5.5 generation is highly sought out because of its Wolves and DAC. While sound quality is subjective, through the headphones compared to the Cirrus source DACs found in most other iPods and iPhones through the years, the Wolfson DAC has a warmer, cozier sound signature, which I tend to prefer for chill listening sessions. All in all, this iPod is a good platform to relive our nostalgia. But what kind of condition are we looking at with this iPod for our glow up? So I bought this iPod Classic 5.5 on eBay for about 47 bucks, and it's pretty beat up. Now the front's actually not too bad. With the shiny black plastic, you can see some scratches and deeper cuts here, but where it's most egregious is on the back with the stainless steel. But that's why we're here. I want to refurb this device to the best of my ability, and I have some accessories to improve the quality of life in both aesthetics, but also functionality. You're not gonna break this one, right? Yeah, I know, we did the PSX a couple of weeks ago and I didn't see success with that refurb job. This thing for some reason is not powering on anymore, but I do think that with a little bit of care, this would be a much better refurb and upgrade process. So what do we have? to actually make our iPod better. Well, for one, I want to replace the battery because the battery life on this was okay for the time, but with a 3000 milliamp hour cell, we're gonna get some serious playtime. We're talking, I think some people were saying around 15 to 18 hours on a single charge. I, Luca's giving me the face, I know, right? Something that this iPod also had was a physical hard drive with a spinning disc and all. But these days we have flash storage with high capacities. And so I got myself one of these. This is an iFlash Solo. These are pretty common in the iPod community. And what this essentially lets me do is replace this physical spinning hard drive with an SD card of my choice. However, what I'm most excited about is to upgrade the aesthetics. I've leaned into some color, which is something that the iPod Classic never really did. So I got myself not only a yellow click wheel, but I also have a yellow front plate. Ooh, look at that. But but most importantly, I want to replace this back shell, which is pretty beat up. Black and 
normal silver stainless steel option here as well. And they both actually have 128 gig labeled on the back to match our SD card, which is pretty sick. So the beauty about tearing down an iPod is that it is very well documented, unlike our PSX. So I have an iFixit tear down here just to help guide me along so that if there is something that I could potentially screw up, I'll know about it ahead of time. I'm gonna learn from my previous mistakes and actually use some guidance of the internet. Cause we have that. What? Yeah, but don't you know? I break, you fix. <laughs> And so I began the teardown process. It did take a moment to separate the front and back shells, but eventually, here we are. There's a ribbon cable attaching the front shell and all of its components to the back plate. So I'm gonna be careful here, but I think I could just straight up take some of this out. Cool, this is like diffusing a bomb. Oh, so there's some like rubber gaskets here for the, for the hard drive. I guess next up, I'm going to take out the hard drive, which is connected by a ribbon cable. And this is where our iFlash Solo is going to be connected as well. As you can see, it corresponds over there. So there's a black, retention thing that I lift up and it frees the hard drive. This thing is tiny. Wow, that is thin. I don't know how common it was to see these things in like external drives, but uh, at least on an iPod, it makes sense. Man, this whole thing is very sticky. Where the PSX was very dusty and I was like coughing and sneezing. <laughs> Grandma Agnes. In order to replace our front shell and the click wheel, I needed to undo some screws in order to separate them from the chassis. But this revealed a bit of the true condition of our iPod Classic. Uh, yeah, these screws are rusted. Wow. In fact, there was so much rust that some of the screws just straight up wouldn't budge. And since we absolutely needed to get this front plate off, I'm just gonna break that where the where it's screwed in. It's not gonna do anything because we're gonna replace the shell anyway. It sucks, but let's just do it. Click wheel button fell, but that's okay. All right, so we're at the point where it's just our screen, chassis mainboard, and our click wheel attached. First off, let's take out the display before we try to disassemble our click wheel. Be a little careful, there we go. Cool. Sick. Nice, so that's display out. Put this over here as well. And with that, I was able to start on our click wheel, which was a bit more of an involved process than I was expecting. You see, beyond unplugging more ribbon cables, after undoing that piece of tape, I have to grab at this little tab over here, which is basically just a ground. Fully detaching the click wheel requires separating the logic board, AKA the brains of our entire iPod, from the mainframe in order to get it free. It required a little bit of force. This don't feel right. Boy, let's go, look at this. With our board off, all that's left is one ribbon cable. Nice, we did it, okay. Our click wheel is fully off and our board is seemingly intact. With our original click wheel out, we can swap in our brand new yellow one. All right, there's nothing for it. Let's just put our new click wheel in. So there's adhesive on here to redo what we took out earlier. we just undo that. We'll connect the ribbon cable to its socket and it's in the lines as well. There are um, some nice guides on the PCB that shows us where it goes and it looks like it's uh, where it's supposed to be. Before I even put this on the mainframe, maybe I try to hack at this to get our screw out. With my handy dandy multi-tool, it took a little bit of elbow grease, but the screws finally came out. Thank God. If not for that, my shiny new faceplate would have had to undergo some modifications, which probably would have compromised the fit and finish, which we don't want because I want this iPod to be perfect. I cleaned up as much of the rust as I could with what I had on hand. And I think we're ready to put this iPod all back together. The adhesive's still young. Yeah, like you. I'm older than you. <laughs> <laughs> but you can still be young. <laughs> <laughs> From here, the reassembly process seemed very straightforward. Just do the opposite of what we did in the teardown. Place the PCB on the frame, put the ribbons and tape back where they were, connect the display to the board, and then, oh, that's it. It is in, oh. Let's go. iPod is iPoding, at least from a 
button perspective, and we have our protector here. We just clean. Yeah, buddy. That looks nice. That looks so nice. This click wheel does feel a little cheaper than the standard one, but not by much. The whole yellow iPod. Woo! Let's go. Nice. Yeah, dust free in the lens. Oh, we are golden. Wow. All right, so our front shell is all good to go. Now it's time to tackle the back one. So not only are we gonna replace this whole thing, but what's captive here is our battery as well as our headphone jack. So let's see what's involved here, but it should be pretty straightforward. Initially, I thought I would have to do some sort of components transplant between our old rear shell and the new one. But to my surprise, Something I didn't expect was that our headphone jack assembly is actually already on here, as well as our buttons and the rings around all of our ports. So I guess now all I have to do is really put the battery in here and also install our iFlash Solo. So ribbon cable goes in here pretty easily. Slide it in, clip down, and uh, it's captive. That could not be any more simpler. Oh, oh my God. This is just so perfectly machined. I mean, it just sits in our mainframe perfectly to the point where it just is there. There's no wiggle, no play. It's just, that's impressive. <laughs> wow. It's even spring loaded. Well, to a point. <laughs> there we go. Nice. All right. So ribbon cables in for our iFlash solo. That's all connected. Let's get our battery in. So I did originally order a 3000 milliamp hour unit from AliExpress, but it turns out that shipping on that is about two months away. Didn't think that was gonna happen. So I bought this guy off of Amazon. Only problem is that it has three stars on its reviews. And I think that's because this ribbon cable supposedly is going the wrong way. People have said that they have had to bend it in a weird orientation to make this work, but uh, I'll be the judge of that and let the record show that I was indeed the judge of that. Oh man, yeah, those those reviews were in line. That's 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 pretty bad. Okay, well I'm gonna do the bend later. We're gonna set it flat first, flat-ish. And then this goes in here like this. Oh, that's gonna be even more annoying. We got our battery one hooked up, which has a very awkward bend once the whole device is closed up. So we're gonna tackle that a little later. The one for our headphone jack, I think is over here. After some careful gymnastics to fit all of these components in, it took a few tries, but eventually... Oh, wait, there, 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 that's it, that's it. Oh, we did it. Yo, some of the plastic is shaving a little bit on its way in, but apart from that, bro. That looks so good. Bro. Yo. That is it. Not too long after refurbishing and upgrading our iPod, the next thing I worked on was the software. And for this project, I installed a popular custom OS called Rockbox, which allows you to do all kinds of neat stuff that Apple never let you do. For example, I like that you can customize the way that the UI looks with themes designed by the Rockbox community. There are plenty of them out there that actually build on Apple's design language to match the iPod nicely, but if you're looking for a completely unique interface, there are plenty of those available as well. However, probably my main reason for installing Rockbox in the first place is because a vast majority of the music that I have archived are in lossless FLAC format, which iPods don't natively support out the box. But when modded with Rockbox, can play them totally fine. Best of all, this makes loading music on the device very straightforward. Plug the iPod into a Mac, PC, or Linux computer, and it'll simply appear as an external storage drive. Regardless of how your files are organized, as long as there's decent track metadata to go off of, Rockbox indexes them into a database automatically without having to deal with iTunes, which is pretty awesome. Having said all of that, however, the Rockbox experience isn't quite all rainbows and sunshine. For one, the UX isn't the most user-friendly thing. Rockbox might have extra functionality, but Apple absolutely killed it with the stock iPod interface and how simple and direct it is. With more moving pieces involved, Rockbox is more prone to reliability issues. I've had occasional performance stutters or straight up freezing 
probably due to the limited amounts of processing power and RAM to handle things like the high fidelity flax or resource intensive themes. Whatever the issue is, it's most certainly a buzzkill. I mean, don't get me wrong, the novelty is fun, but when I could just as easily switch back to my smartphone and Bluetooth earbuds, this shit has to work flawlessly. Beyond that, the Rockbox installation itself is kind of scuffed, and while it's been around for over 20 years at this point, sifting through generations worth of documentation on the wiki and the forums in order to troubleshoot problems that can arise can prove rather troublesome. It certainly doesn't help that the website looks and feels very outdated, which isn't the most approachable thing out there when you're trying to fix things. Despite my issues, however, after a week of daily use, I've rekindled my love for the iPod. You see, every now and then, I like to disconnect from the internet to take a break from work and social media. It turns out having a dedicated media player as someone that listens to music pretty regularly can help reduce the urge to grab my smartphone. Regular viewers of the channel already know that I mainly listen to J-pop and anime music artists. So I loaded up a bunch of tracks that I'm currently listening to now, as well as ones that I listened to back in high school, since listening to an iPod naturally got me very nostalgic. And truth be told, it's a vibe. Not only is the yellow iPod a fun visual flex when going out to the mall or grabbing groceries, but paired with my Cos Porta Pros and that Wolfson DAC, you get incredibly warm sound that pairs well with anything from electronic music to rock. It might not offer the most accuracy or detail, but it's about sounding chill and laid back. And that's what I like about it. Running the clock ahead by over a decade, smartphones not only have become wildly popular, but we also found ways to fold them as well. And turns out you can actually buy one of these bendy smartphones for only $200. When it comes to foldables, people get antsy for a few reasons. Durability, maybe it's the crease running across a display, and of course there's the cost. But what if the price is so good, it makes you think? This is the Moto Razr, and in the used market, it is the cheapest folding phone you can buy at $200. But while it might not be my first choice as a daily driver at this price, especially in the scheme of older flagships and solid mid-range options, perhaps it's a really good secondary device, or if you're looking to take the plunge on foldables overall, this is a pretty low cost option to see if it's even your thing. But we'll get to the nitty gritty in just a second. First, a little bit of context. When Motorola first announced this thing, the mix of nostalgia and curiosity got me excited. As someone that grew up with the iconic Moto Razr in the early 2000s, I was all about the reboot. I wasn't the only one. After all, the 2004 Razer V3 sold 120 million units around the world. <sighs> Gotta take a breath there. Not only is this an impressive number, but it also makes it the best-selling clamshell phone ever. So with folding smartphones reaching their proof of concept arc heading into the 2020s, Motorola figured it was time to continue the legacy. It's funny, Austin and I were actually invited to the announcement keynote in LA, and it was probably the worst event we've ever attended. And welcome to the loudest video I have ever made. If you can't tell right now, Diplo is playing behind me. It's quite loud here. It almost felt more like a party than it did a work function, which didn't inspire much confidence when it finally came time to gather our thoughts for our YouTube video on it. And the overall reception of the phone wasn't favorable among reviewers long-term either. But now in the present day, considering I bought this for $200, which is way less than the 1500 it went for a few years ago, along with the benefit of hindsight, I've learned to appreciate it a bit more. The $300 discount didn't help that, did it? Mm -mm. Is that 80% off? I don't know, gotta ask a different Asian for that one. <laughs> if I had to guess, the aesthetics are likely why anyone would look toward the 2019 Razer. It shares the same silhouette as the OG, which is to say, striking. We loved it back in 2004 because it was razor thin, especially when opened up. And that's also the case here. Something I totally forgot about the foldable Moto Razor is that you can emulate the OG. 
Come around. If you go into your quick settings, you can add a tile called Retro Razor. Tap on it and... So what can I actually do with this? Messaging? Oh, it just brings up text messaging. Okay, that's a little... So it's just a glorified launcher. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> It does have a sizable chin, which is kind of taboo in this day and age of thin bezels, but personally, I can give this a pass. Nothing against chins, because I have two of them. <laughs> Flip the phone open and you're greeted with a 6.2 inch P OLED screen. By 2023 standards, the picture quality and resolution is nothing to write home about. But what I'm really impressed by is how Motorola minimized the screen crease while folding the phone. It all has to do with its clever hinge mechanism, which does two things. One, it increases the radius of the fold, which you can actually see the screen dip in to distribute the pressure so it's not just hitting one part of the screen. And two, the whole screen physically shifts into the chin to further reduce strain. The result is a less distinct crease that you'll only really notice if the phone's off. Pretty neat. If I have any concerns though, it would be with durability. Remember, this phone came off the heels of the controversial first generation Galaxy Fold, when consumer folding phones were going through major pain points. The Razer might have a gapless design, which minimizes debris and dust from hitting the main display while folded up. However, being one of the first foldables to hit the mass market, the Razer screen is noticeably soft. Look past the screen and the hinge has clearly seen better days. I mean, literally this is a used phone, but I mean, come on. Oh, whoa, 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 no, no. Austin threw me his Z Flip 4 and, oh, that's what a hinge should be like. In fact, look at that. Oof, it stops anywhere you want it to. Oof. This is actual quality here, though Samsung has had the benefit of a couple of generations. Even though the previous owner ate all the wear, tear, and depreciation on this device, even at $200, it's still something to keep in mind. Also, on the topic of value, let's talk about the brains of this thing, the Snapdragon 710. Considering it's a mid-range processor that predates the Razer by two years, Motorola really skimped out on performance. Again, they charged $1,500 for this thing at launch. And even at $200 here in 2023, it's still an unfortunate pain point. Compared to Samsung, who released the first Gen Z Flip a few days after the Razer and included a one-year-old flagship Snapdragon chip, Motorola really dropped the ball here. Now, it's not horribly slow for normal casual use, but start gaming or multitasking and it starts to fall apart a bit. Now, if there's anything I like about the Razer compared to the competition, it's the cover display. With a bigger screen, you're able to take selfies easier, have better access to media controls, and see more notifications. In fact, I remember Austin's old Z Flip with the little tiny screen, you could barely do enough on that. Considering it took a few generations for the Z Flip to catch up to this level of functionality, credit where credit's due to Motorola. And this got me thinking about where the company is as a whole. At its peak, Motorola was a leading mainstream brand with plenty of premium options a decade or so ago. But now they're not necessarily a small name, but it definitely lives in the shadow of what it once was. Now under Lenovo, and claiming a decent share of the low and mid-range smartphone segment. But it's not to say they haven't tried to return to form. I'm under the impression that they get how hard it is to break into the high-end market, to go up against the Samsungs and Apples of the world. Hence why they tossed a Hail Mary with the Razer early on. While this phone ended up being a flop, it was at least viable enough for Motorola to iterate year over year, all the way to current day, with rumors of one including a body size cover display, which would be sick. However, what gets me most excited is the concept they showed off at this year's MWC in Barcelona. So we're here at MWC at the Lenovo booth, taking a look at the, is it called the riser? What is it officially called? Is it a concept? It's a proof of concept. This is called the Motorola Rollable Proof of Concept. Of course, the riser, or 
Rizzer, whatever they end up calling it, is still a proof of concept. So it's far from perfect. I do have some concerns with durability since the screen is actually rolling exposed under the phone. And also the whole mechanism is motorized, which certainly can be another point of failure. In fairness, the custom case they designed for it seemed to work to address some of these issues. And it might even inform how they construct the chassis if they do put this to market. But really my favorite point about this phone is the form factor, or form factors. The size of this thing in its most compact mode feels so good in the hands. And of course, having the options to go bigger when you need it is sweet, and ultimately why we like these alternate designs anyway. They've done some trick things with the software to make this surprisingly cohesive. It'll unravel to a custom aspect ratio depending on the video you're watching, and it'll slide in the opposite direction to reveal an earpiece and front-facing camera. And when the whole thing's rolled up, you can still use the rear display when it's face down. I go as far as saying this phone feels closer to a finished product than I was expecting, or at least not completely jank compared to other rollable concepts that I've seen in passing. If this is how Motorola plans to break through once again, I want to see them succeed. So folding screens might be a bit of a stretch, but what about phones with two screens? Maybe that could work well. This smartphone costs a little over $200. And while it might seem unassuming, it has a unique party trick. My name is Ken and you're watching Denki. Dun, 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 dun. Finding variety with today's smartphones is tough. Yes, there might be differing sensibilities between, say, an iPhone and a Galaxy, but I think innovation in smartphones have stagnated, where the look, feel, and overall functionality aren't evolving as much as I'd like. Most phones aren't wowing me in the way that makes me feel like I bought something even remotely close to an earth-shattering product. Yes, foldables like the Z Flip 5 exist, which I've been daily driving and have been enjoying my time with. However, I have to admit that bendy screens don't have the level of durability and consistency of a traditional rectangular smartphone and are somewhat expensive for being a novelty. But turns out that's not the only way to get a unique looking phone. Enter the LG Wing. When it came out in 2020, it retailed for 1,000 US dollars. But right now you can find it for around 225. A great price for one of the most unique phones you can buy today. On first impression, this phone is business as usual. The glass and aluminum build feels premium, if not a tad bit chunky in the hands, which is not out of the ordinary. And the 6.8 inch OLED screen looks sharp with vivid colors. But things start to get all weird when you slide up the bottom right corner to reveal this 3.9 inch secondary display, transforming this phone into something unlike anything you'd find in today's market. What's clear to me is that LG put a lot of effort into the hinge mechanism. Winging it is effortless with one hand since the action is spring-loaded, but it also comes to a soft stop at the end. That extra bit is important because hurling the mass of a whole as display would cause quite a bit of recoil if not for some dampening. You wouldn't want to drop your fancy new toy because of its main gimmick. So props to LG for putting in the extra effort here. The first thing you'll notice sliding open the wing is its dedicated home screen. Here, you can quickly launch whatever apps you customize it with, which kind of reminds me of the old cover flow feature on the iPod. But something that stood out to me is that the LG wing really shines when it comes to multitasking. Not so much in the productivity sense, but rather for content consumption. I can't be the only one who does this, but I constantly find myself browsing Twitter or looking things up while watching YouTube or Netflix. Well, with the Wing, you can have the main display in landscape to play video full screen, then use the smaller display to browse the web or social media. Especially if you're a VTuber enjoyer just like me, this phone works so well for that. Plus, the software is surprisingly thought out in places I wasn't expecting for dual screen use. For example, if I'm searching for a YouTube video with the main display, a keyboard pops up on the secondary one, which 
feels surprisingly intuitive. Also, the camera app does a clever thing where you can get a clean preview of what you're shooting up top with all of your controls out of the way on the bottom display. Stuff like this makes the quirky form factor feel more usable and practical than you'd expect, even if third-party app support to fully take advantage of the setup is admittedly few and far between. Best of all, when you don't need to wing it, it just closes up. No, don't call 911. Hello, police? We do have his description. Can we take that? Let's take his description. Just close it up and it becomes a normal Android phone. On top of that, something that surprised me revisiting this device after almost three years is that it actually got an update a few months ago. If you didn't know, LG basically axed its mobile division in 2021, not too long after they came out with the Wing. It's a shame because the company genuinely felt innovative in key areas, selling phones with dual screen cases, and audio grade file headphone jacks at a time when competitors were streamlining, simplifying, and flat out removing features. You said audio grade files. Audio grade files. I can't even blame my mild dyslexia for that one. I'm just dumb. <laughs> I never got to own an LG V-series phone, but I've always wanted one mainly to listen to music because the DACs on them are great. But I did have an LG Velvet with the dual screen case, which was awesome for multitasking, especially at a time when the Galaxy Fold was just coming out and that was literally shitting the bed. But LG, props to them, they actually executed pretty well. The LG Wing was basically a Hail Mary to jumpstart LG's phone business, but sadly, it didn't end up panning out. Despite that, the Wing recently got bumped up to Android 13 this past summer, which is awesome to see, especially since LG phone appreciators still exist and even go as far as modifying their devices to keep them in use. On the extreme end, some people are straight up taking the Wing apart and modifying them into tiny Android emulator machines. It takes a bit of ingenuity and craftsmanship to do, but the results are honestly breathtaking. I'd actually make myself a little handheld as well, but I want to keep this particular phone around, mainly for posterity, and emulators aren't really my thing. Plus, knowing me, I'd probably just break it badly anyway, and why ruin a perfectly working smartphone? For science. For science. The point that I'm about to make might not necessarily come across watching it through a YouTube video, but the ergonomics of the LG Wing are a bit tricky in the hand. You see, something we take for granted on normal rectangular smartphones is that normally the weight is pretty balanced and distributed. But the LG Wing, for as interesting as it looks, it's not the most pleasant phone to hold. Let's just say that balance is not one of its strong suits. I often find myself holding it opened up by the main screen, especially when watching video for a few minutes, since the center of gravity is biased upstream. I can literally hold it here and you can kind of see how it's balanced. However, it's clearly not meant for this, since the touch points, especially up here with the edges, are a bit sharp. Additionally, for what was a $1,000 flagship in 2020, performance was never the Wing's strong suit, especially for the price. Powered by a mid-range Snapdragon 765G, performance was solid, but hardly lit a candle against competitors like the Galaxy S20 and iPhone 12. In 2023, it's generally fine for juggling media and productivity, though it does stutter from time to time and certainly chugs when playing playing today's slate of mobile games. Arguably, this is within the realm of expectation for a $225 or so phone, but just keep this in mind. Moving on, something that's not really my cup of tea is the software experience. For all the cool phones that LG has made over the years, their take on Android was never my favorite. Visually, it's always looked too bubbly and tacky. And maybe it's just my Korean review unit, but the amount of bloat you get on this phone is nuts. These nuts? Luke. <laughs> you get apps for LG's ecosystem, social media apps that you're not even a part of, games, shopping, etc. that I simply don't care about. And the company's enhancements to Android, like their universal search function, for example, never worked well and 
honestly makes Android feel clunky. Also, while the Wing received its update to Android 13, the company previously stated that it was only planning to support it for up to three major Android versions. Considering that it launched with Android 10, in theory, this is the end of the road. Now, don't get me wrong. I'll give LG props for keeping their word and bringing the wing up to date, but it's kind of sad to think that this update was the final breath before we truly say goodbye to LG Mobile for good. Rip in pepperoni. Pepperoni? Rest in pepperoni. I hope you rest in pepperoni. I cry every time. Lastly, the cameras on the wing are decent, but something I totally forgot about is that the selfie camera pops up. It's a neat little thing that some phones did before the pandemic, though on my review unit, it decided to magically break itself midway through testing. It won't fully go flush with the body anymore, and judging by the fact that I can kind of push down to almost flush means that there's probably something wrong with the motor. Moving components like this breaking were a major concern by long-term critics and keyboard warriors on the internet, which is probably why companies stopped doing it. So if that was you, right, I told you so in the comments below. We're looking at another smartphone with two screens and this one only costs $250. This phone is called the V60. Just like the Wing, this dual screen contraption also comes from LG as a sort of last hurrah before the company shut down its mobile phone business in 2021. So that's a bit of the context, but what is this all about? Well, the V60 certainly looks unique, but the phone isn't actually dual screen by default. Rather, this is an official add-on case which works natively with the V60. Popping the phone out reveals that it's all done via USB-C, but I'll get to the juicy details on that a little later on in the video. Because beyond this insanely cool case, the V60 itself holds more quirks to sink our teeth into. First, I want to talk about the basics, starting with the design. Something that surprised me when I first held this phone after a few years is how well the aesthetic holds up even today. The V60 looks particularly slick in this navy blue colorway. It just oozes premiumness, especially with the gold rails. It also feels good in the hands as well. There's some heft to it, but I really like the chamfered edges on the rails, which help to add some grip. For this design as a whole, I wouldn't expect anything less from LG's top of the line flagship for the time. But especially if you're spending around $180 to $220 just on the phone alone, it certainly doesn't feel like you cheaped out. Speaking of flagships, unlike that LG Wing that I mentioned earlier, the V60 is way more competent a smartphone by 2023 standards when it comes to performance. Powered by a Snapdragon 865G, this chip was flagship spec for 2019 and still packs a solid punch in current day. Of course, with this being an older phone, you should curb your expectations appropriately, but when we're talking about performance roughly equivalent to something like the newer Tensor G2 on the Pixel 7, suddenly this three-year-old LG V60 doesn't look too shabby. And on top of that, it just got updated to Android 13 earlier this year. So it's relatively up to date on the software side, though just keep in mind that technically it's the final year of committed software updates from LG and that you'll be on your own if you're planning on using the V60 long term. However, the real reason why any enthusiast would look at the V60 today is because it truly embodied the idea of a no compromises flagship. Oh look, it's me! I'm in the phone! Hi! Hi! <laughs> Where phone manufacturers like Apple and Samsung would consciously simplify and take away features from their high-end devices, the gimmick with LG's V-series phones was that they did the exact opposite, which is to say, keeping features in or adding ones that genuinely felt useful. One of those that stood out to me a lot 
is the headphone jack. Sure, these days, Bluetooth headphones are pretty common, but as someone that still enjoys a nice pair of wired headphones every now and then, the V60 scratches that itch with flying colors. Not only does it do the job, but LG also fit this phone with a high quality DAC. Trying out the V60 with my tried and true Cost Porter Pros, or even my Sony CD900 STs, the sound quality I was getting was impressive, especially while playing high-res audio files on Apple Music. And depending on what headphones you're using, messing around with the digital filters and presets built in can add a tasteful dab, dab of color and excitement to the sound. Oh my God. <laughs> Now, I don't want to oversell the DAC. I still think you can get better sound and more power for high impedance headphones when using an external USB one. But again, we got to appreciate the effort that LG put in here. The V60's biggest gimmick by far is this add-on case, which transforms it into a dual screen phone. It does make this whole thing chunkier, but considering that people put cases on their phones anyway, the extra heft isn't too bad given the extra functionality. As far as the second screen goes, it's basically a carbon copy of the V60's main display, with the same color, brightness, and even has a notch though this one does not have a camera in it. Though of course, what's really important here is how Android takes advantage of the extra display. I love how simple multitasking is on this V60. All you have to do is launch apps on the respective screens you want and you're practically good to go. Watch a YouTube video while playing Genshin. Browse Twitter while watching Netflix or type up Google Docs while doing research on Chrome. LG more or less lets you run any apps you want in tandem, and you can even save app pairings as presets on your home screen for easy access. Then, for those times when you want to use the phone in single screen mode, flip the auxiliary screen back and it automatically shuts off to prevent accidental inputs and to save battery. Speaking of which, the dual screen case does not have its own battery and actually draws power from the phone itself. I think this is an okay trade-off in order to keep the size down and it doesn't drain the battery as much as I thought it would. The V60's 5,000 milliamp hour battery lasts through a whole workday and part of the evening while running apps in tandem on both displays. Now, don't get me wrong, the battery life is not amazing, but I think it's livable and can certainly go farther with a bit of optimization. However, all of this being said, I do have some big gripes with this case. For one, I don't like the way it looks, especially considering how nice the V60 looks stock. Cases will always dull the look of a phone, but this one in particular gets all kinds of smudgy especially on the cover portion. In fairness, it's nice that they give you a small screen for the time and some notification icons, but this whole thing does not need to be glass. Again, this thing gets super fingerprinty, but it's also another thing that can break, which frankly speaking is dumb design, considering this entire case retailed for $100 back in the day. In fact, I paid 80 bucks for this in 2020 new in box. Still feel like it was kind of a rip. Also, while somewhat unavoidable, another pain point that I had is that the secondary display is exposed to the elements when the hinge is fully open for full screen use. If you already have anxiety about cracking glass on your phone, imagine having a usable screen on both sides. Not good. Additionally, I don't love the charging solution on this case. With the USB-C port plugging into the phone inside the case, there's not a lot of room for pass-through power from the outside. So the solution that LG figured out was a low-profile magnetic pogo connector. Now, to its credit, it's pretty nice and convenient in the same way that old-school MagSafe was on MacBooks. But I don't like that it's proprietary. Of course, the case includes an adapter in the box that plugs into USB-C on one end. But if you lose that tiny little guy, it'll cost $25 to replace. And if not for that, 
you'll be taking the V60 in and out of the case every single time you need to charge, which as you can imagine, would be pretty annoying. Though for me personally, given the trade-offs, I rarely keep the case on anyway. The V60 just feels better in its purest form. Simple design, but enthusiast focused and relatively up to date on its software. It's hard to ask for anything more, except for maybe LG to come back and give us a sequel. Only one can dream. That's it, it's just a dream. I don't think they're coming back. Man, LG really loved making dual screen phones, but they weren't the only ones doubling down down on this tech. Once again, I am taking a look at a phone with two screens that only cost me $200. With that, let's jump in and find out what this one's all about. What I have here is the original Surface Duo. This was Microsoft's answer to the foldable smartphone market that was released in September of 2020. Now, this isn't my first run-in with the Surface Duo. I was actually at the launch event in New York City prior to the pandemic, and then there, they talked up a pretty big game about how they collaborated with Google in order to optimize the dual screen Android experience. This was also right around the time where other smartphone brands were experimenting with alternative form factors. Samsung had tried and failed with the first gen Galaxy Fold, and even LG was experimenting with the Wing, as well as dual screen accessories for phones like the V60 and LG Velvet. We actually took a look at some of these phones on the channel last year, so definitely go check that out if you're feeling particularly nostalgic. But, woo, okay, our Surface Duo looking pretty clean. So again, we bought this for $200 on eBay. It's actually an offer that I made to the seller, which they happily accepted. And this is looking like it's in solid condition. Granted, there are some fingerprints on the screen, but no scratches to be found. Actually, there are maybe two or so longer scratches here and maybe some scuffing on the sides, but nothing too egregious in the scheme of wear and tear over the past couple of years. And the screen looks totally fine. Yo, I forgot how thin this device was and the hinge feels so good. This is certainly the epitome of premium I think you can get for 200 bucks. This is a solid, solid device. And the fact that this came with the box as well, again, for 200 bucks, dang. All right. Now, while I don't think this would make a great primary smartphone for reasons that we'll get to a little later on in the video, I think this could actually make for a great secondary phone or even just owning it for the sake of novelty could be cool because I have a feeling with this unique design that it'll be very fun to have around. Let's turn it on if it'll power on. Oh, it needs a charge. <laughs> All right, and there we go. Powered by Android and not Windows. Oh yeah, man. The pixel density on these displays are so good. That is crispy. Yeah. All right, let me go set up this phone, use it for a couple of days, and I'll report back with some of my thoughts. Three days later. All right, Surface Duo. When this phone launched in 2020, it retailed for an eye-watering $1,400, which at that price set expectations quite high amongst reviewers. But ultimately, the experience ended up being half-baked, buggy, and it didn't help that it was running a flat flagship Snapdragon processor from a generation prior. It was far from being a good value in 2020, but now in 2024, and with $1,200 in depreciation, as well as some software updates, I think the Surface Duo has a new lease on life. It ended up being way better than I was expecting it to be. First of all, as someone that's used plenty of Android foldables in the past, there's something that feels organic about multitasking between two individual displays. Each of them are 5.6 inches diagonally with a 1350 by 1800 resolution and an aspect ratio of four by three. That gives us plenty of screen real estate to take advantage of, especially with Microsoft's own build of Android 12. You are able to launch apps independently on each screen, as well as span one singular app across the displays to make it a pseudo tablet with a three by two aspect ratio. And thankfully the screens are offset toward the center of the device when fully opened up 
to visually minimize the gap. That said, it is quite satisfying when you find an app that actually optimizes for the dual displays. For example, using the Kindle app to read on the Duo like it's a book is pretty sick. And because of the dual screen arrangement on here, how could I not try some Nintendo DS emulation? For this, I'm using an app called Drastic, and it feels right at home on this device. Even the touch controls work perfectly. You'll still want to use a physical controller for the most optimal experience, though keep in mind that fitment with controller grips can be a bit tricky thanks to the Duo's odd shape and the placement of its USB-C port. I tried out the Razer Kishi, which was a no-go. I also gave the Backbone a shot, which was kind of doable, but really something like the GameSir X2S is absolutely perfect for an odd device like the Surface Duo. They actually kind of look like they were made for each other. Something that also surprised me was the performance. The 2019 Snapdragon 855 might not hold a candle to more modern flagship SoCs, but it's no slouch either, especially given that I had decent experiences with both the Gen 1 Moto Razr foldable as well as the LG Wing, both of which had mid-range specs for around that time period. By comparison, the 855 offers plenty more performance. And again, I can't stress enough how much I love this design. It's certainly wider than the average Ultra and Pro Max smartphone, but carrying this around almost feels akin to having a moleskin notebook, only if it were made out of glass and aluminum. Plus, the fit and finish is very characteristic of Surface, which is to say, very high quality. The hinge is perfectly tuned, it's smooth and will lock into any position you leave it at, and it goes all the way around completely flush. This allows you to use the Duo in single screen mode, much like a normal smartphone, again, just with a wider profile. And I must say that the tolerance is super satisfying here. You might not expect the closing of glass on glass to result in a soft close, but yeah, that sounds so good. However, this brings me to one of a few major drawbacks I found with the Surface Duo, even considering its $200 price point. Firstly, with this phone being majority glass on all four sides, durability is a major concern. There is a lot of slippery surface area on here to scratch or crack, and with an iFixit repairability score, of two, best rocket with the stock bumper, some kind of case, or a skin from dbrand as a precaution. Something else that can be polarizing for people is that the screen bezels are quite large, especially on the top and bottom. I do think this deserves a little bit of a pass, given that it gives your fingers and hands more places to hold, which is nice considering how thin this device can get. But visually, even for a phone from 2020, it does hold the design back quite a bit. Now, while Microsoft worked with Google to optimize Android for the Surface Duo, even after they had updated the firmware to address reliability issues early on, bugs and oversights with the UX can be quite annoying to deal with from time to time. There are little quirks here and there, like the phone getting very confused on how to auto-rotate. Sometimes apps like to open up in landscape, other times they'll open up in portrait. One moment, it might listen to the accelerometer and rotate the screen on demand, and then later on, it just flat out will not work. There's no consistency here, which is very annoying. Also, while it is cool that you're able to span apps across both displays to make this one gigantic tablet, something I find odd is that there's actually a dead zone of pixels square in the middle where the bezel and hinge are, as if there was a piece of screen here. This can be especially annoying when you have to get to a UI element, such as a button or a piece of text, and it's aligned perfectly in the center right where that dead zone is. 
Fishing it out is never all that hard. Usually I have to force an app into single screen mode, do what I have to do, then expand it out again in order to make it work. But if you have to do it often, like I had to do when I was setting up this phone, it didn't quite leave me with the best first impression. Looking beyond the quirks in UX due to this phone's dual screens, it is a shame to see that the Surface Duo is not getting any more Android software updates. Plus, I think the stock launcher on the Surface Duo looks kind of bad from a visual perspective. There's a lot of wasted space, especially with the home screen dock. And on top of all of that, this phone came with so much bloatware installed. To be fair, this might be par for the course considering it's a $200 smartphone, but imagine someone paying that $1,400 premium back in the day only to find ads for DirecTV and the NBA. Not cool. Additionally, there is a camera on here, though it's only really good for video calls. If you're expecting flagship camera quality from a 2020 phone, you're not gonna get it here with the Surface Duo. And lastly, there is the battery, which is rather small. Considering how crazy thin the Surface Duo is, credit where credit's due, the fact that Microsoft fit a 3,500 milliamp hour battery in here is impressive. However, considering the fact that this got up updated to Android 12 and also probably experienced some battery degradation with age, I find it difficult to get more than a couple of hours out of this thing when watching videos, browsing socials, and light emulation gameplay. For better or for worse, this phone also doesn't have 5G, but if it did, holy sh this would probably last all of like 10 minutes. But undeniably, this is among the most unique devices that you can buy at this price point, and it is still surprisingly capable for an Android phone in 2024. Okay, so we got bendy phones, we got phones with two screens, but what about the PlayStation phone? Sort of. It's called the Xperia Play, and when it came out in 2011, it was poised to be the perfect smartphone for gaming. It had an excellent touchscreen, ran Android 2.3 Gingerbread, and even had excellent performance to boot. However, its main party trick was its sliding form factor to reveal a portable PlayStation experience. I was able to grab this particular one from eBay for around 80 bucks, and in this video, I want to find out what this device is all about and what I can actually do with it in 2024. And here it is, the Sony Xperia Play. Once again, we bought this off of eBay refurbished. They shipped it from China and it came in this rather generic looking box. Also, it didn't come padded very well, so I hope it was delivered in one piece. Fingers crossed. Ah. Not the worst. Uh, the cable is kind of floating and we do have a charging brick in here as well. This appears to be a 15 watt charger, USB-A on one side and micro USB. And here it is, the Xperia Play itself. I gotta say, this is actually in decent quality. The edge is not showing any scratches really, so that's a good sign. We have a screen protector on the front. Yeah, that is super clean. Hell yeah. All right. Now, the thing I really want to try out here is the sliding action. Ooh, that is nice. So there's a bit of some spring-loaded action in there, so it kind of just goes up on its own once you give it a little bit of force, which is very satisfying. Our face buttons, the square triangle X circle, do feel tactile, though they aren't as raised as I'd like them to be, though this is probably because the phone is pretty slim. But the D-pad though, yeah, those buttons are raised and also feel just as tactile. Oh, that is nice. And because this device is so thin, we don't have any physical thumbsticks, but rather these touch ones which will be rather interesting to try out. But without further ado, let's actually turn this thing on. Hey, there we go. Ooh, that's Sony Ericsson animation looking uh, pretty dated, but also uh, kind of retro. I like that. You know what? This screen does not look all that bad. It's certainly held up over time. And for 2011, this would have gone up against, I believe, the iPhone 4S, which did have a retina display. So something with this pixel density 
was not all that uncommon. But take the 4-inch screen from the Xperia Play and compare it to something like a Pro Max in 2024, and this whole entire phone is just screen and engulfs the Xperia Play. Man, times have certainly changed. But now that we have the Xperia Play on, what happens if we just... Oh, okay. So a game launcher appears and it looks like we have a bunch of pre-installed stuff on here. So there's Bruce Lee, Dragon Warrior, FIFA 10, Star Battalion, and The Sims 3. All right, I mean, that's a very eclectic group of games. Now, before I jump into actually... Whoa, okay. The phone suddenly shut off. Why? <laughs> I wonder if this battery is any good. There was a blinking red light up top. I don't know if we caught that on camera, but let me plug it in. To be fair, I don't know how long this phone was actually sitting in the box, so maybe it did just die. All right, I'm gonna let this phone charge a bit more. I'll also get some other games on here, play them as well, and I'll report back with my experience. All right, I spent a little bit of time trying out the Xperia Play. And while I most certainly bought it for gaming, it is a smartphone of the time, featuring a lot of things we took for granted back in 2011. For example, we have a removable backplate and battery, which is kind of nice considering that the 1500 milliamp hour battery in this one doesn't hold a charge all that well. In fact, if you see this particular Xperia Play tethered to a plug throughout the video, you know why. However, at the very least, it's good to know that you can buy replacements on AliExpress for around $10. I just haven't had the time to do that yet. Above the battery, there is a full-sized SIM card slot, which I haven't been able to test out since I only have a micro SIM, which needs an adapter, which I don't have. But presumably, I'd be able to connect this to Verizon over 4G. But what is most important is the fact that there is a micro SD card slot, meaning you can expand from the internal storage on here, which will be especially useful once we get to gaming, which I will talk about in just a moment. Hell yeah, there is a headphone jack on here. Remember when we didn't have to worry about phones not having those? Plus, the Xperia Play came from a time where physical navigation buttons were still the norm. Yeah, software-based gestures and touch controls have come a long way in the past decade, but there is absolutely something to having real tactile buttons you can actually feel. In fact, slide the phone open to reveal that PlayStation style controller and you can use it to navigate around Android, which is awesome. Now, while the Xperia Play was rather big for its time with the four inch display and considerable heft, I think in some ways it feels more confidence inspiring in the hands compared to the phones of today, albeit feeling a bit cheapy and plasticky. Cheapy and plasticky. Words. But of course, the Xperia Play was more than just a smartphone. It also tried to be a portable handheld gaming device as well. But how does it hold up in 2024? Firstly, there were a handful of titles available for the Xperia Play natively, but since it wasn't as widely adopted as portable consoles like the PSP, this platform never had the opportunity to be fully fleshed out. It could certainly run all kinds of Android-based games of the time, but most apps simply weren't coded to work with the Play's built-in controller. That being said, where I think the potential really lied with this device... <laughs> was with PlayStation 1 emulation. That sound never gets old. Also, the speakers on this thing are pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> to give us a little taste of what's possible here, the Xperia Play came with a copy of Crash Bandicoot. On newer models of the Xperia Play, it came pre-installed, though older ones apparently got a firmware update that loaded it onto the device, which is pretty cool. The performance here is pretty good. It's honestly close to what you could expect from a PS Vita or a PSP when it comes to PS1 emulation. However, for me, the real standout here has to be 
the controls. It truly feels like you are playing on a portable PlayStation. I mean, go figure. It is kind of like a PSP Go in terms of the form factor, but since it's a bit smaller, you would think that it might be slightly uncomfortable, but honestly, it's not. It actually feels more like the perfect size, especially considering that it is ultra portable and will fit in your pocket rather nice. Perhaps the only real hiccup that I've experienced with this controller scheme is that my touchpad doesn't work properly. Sometimes it doesn't register my inputs, but as you can see on the emulator that the Xperia Play provides, I do have it mapped on here to correspond to an actual analog stick control. But uh, when I move around, or at least try to, uh, it does register my inputs, but not the ones that I want. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that is way better. We're just gonna stick to the D-pad here. But honestly, that doesn't really matter to me because I've read some reviews back in the day of the Xperia Play, and one of the pain points was in fact these virtual analog sticks. They just never really felt all that good. Oh, nope, nope, not the TNT. <laughs> That's a skunk. Now, what is interesting about playing Crash Bandicoot on this device is that it's not like you can just drop any PS1 ISO onto your micro SD card and have the phone recognize it. The idea here was that game publishers could optimize their titles for devices like this, though inevitably this platform never panned out. Again, due to the lackluster adoption of users and the industry. But surprise, surprise, this never really stopped people from making the most of their Xperia plays and loading their own games. One popular method of getting original PlayStation games on this device is using an ISO patcher called PS Xperia. It essentially takes this original copy of Crash Bandicoot as a base and augments all of the special compatibility bits onto standard ISOs and essentially turns them into Android APKs that the Xperia Play can run. However, mileage kind of varies with this method. Jump into a modified version of Pro Skater 2, and I can absolutely confirm that this weird looking figure in the middle of my screen is in fact not Tony Hawk. Yeah, man, the glitching on this game is so bad. And this is the case for a lot of titles, if you can even get them running. Luckily, there are compatibility lists out there that help you find out what does and doesn't work. But really, you're going to want to run an emulation platform such as RetroArch, since, of course, we do have the flexibility of Android. Users across the internet have gotten the Xperia Play up and running to emulate all kinds kinds of different consoles, including the SNES and Game Boy. Though I will say that in my own experience, I think getting this phone set up for actual gaming emulation is very much a test of patience. No matter what direction I tried to take this Xperia Play, I was met with a lot of resistance. By today's standards, the Android interface on here is quite clunky. I mean, for God's sakes, there's no proper app switcher, meaning if you need to close apps, you're going to have to dive into the settings. And in fact, you have to dive into the settings for a lot of things like toggling Wi-Fi or even changing up screen brightness. This needing to hop back and forth between the tasks that you're trying to do and going into the settings app can be quite annoying, especially when it comes to troubleshooting issues. And to add insult to injury, most of the connected apps and services on this device are broken because old. Plus, on top of that, websites treat the web browser on here like you walked into the wrong f***ing neighborhood. I don't know if you can tell, but I found this whole experience rather frustrating. Wrestling a 13-year-old version of Android absolutely sucks. And while you can do things like root your phone or flash better firmware, especially when you can spend $80 to get a decent purpose-built emulator machine, or 
a controller grip for the smartphone that you already own, diehards might not exactly like to hear it, but this experience does make me wonder if the novelty of owning a pseudo PlayStation phone is really worth all the trouble. It could be a fun project for collectors or enthusiasts out there to sink their teeth into, but for most people, I think it's a tough sell. Okay, so that was the Xperia Play, which was a pseudo PlayStation phone. But what about an actual PlayStation for your living room that everyone seemed to forget about? Believe it or not, this is a PlayStation. It's called the PSX. And when it launched in 2003, it was the most badass overkill machine for your living room that money could buy. And now I finally have one. Only this one's partially working, but I think I can fix that. So in this video, I want to talk about what made the PSX so cool and to see if I could bring this console back to life. Let's jump right in. For all intents and purposes, the PSX really is just a normal PlayStation 2, but in a much bigger shell and with more features. And before anyone brings it up, yes, the term PSX was used as a nickname for the PlayStation 1, but this, this is the real PSX. It has the Emotion Engine chip and graphic synthesizer to let you play all of your PS1 and PS2 games, and even has two memory card slots and the two controller ports on the back to hook up your DualShocks, just like a normal PlayStation 2. But in reality, the PSX was more than just a game console. It was meant to be your home media center. Of course, with a disk drive, you can play both CDs and DVDs but the PSX also allowed you to watch and record your favorite TV shows. That's due to the fact that this system has a bunch of inputs on it, from RCA to a bunch of coax, and it also has a large built-in hard drive. They came configured with anywhere between 160 to 256 gigs of storage all the way back in 2003, which was a lot back then. And of course, if not for using your PSX as a TV DVR, you could use that extra hard drive space to rip your whole library of CDs or stow all of your downloaded movies. All of this to say that the PSX was clearly aimed at media junkies that wanted the best of the best in their living rooms. I mean, look at the back of this thing. That's just a stupid amount of IO. This is some serious hardware. All of this functionality is cool and all, but as a Sony nerd, what really gets me going about the PSX is that this is the first time the company ever used the Cross Media Bar, or XMB. It's most known for being the home interface for the PSP, the PS3, and a bunch of Sony's TVs in the late 2000s, but where it all started was the PSX. However, for as cool as this whole package is, unfortunately, it never saw any commercial success. Turns out that overkill home theater boxes are very hard to sell, and this one was expensive at that. When the PSX debuted in 2003, it retailed for a whopping 80,000 yen, or 800 US dollars. Oof. Oof, yikes. And while Sony was ultimately planning on releasing the PSX in markets like North America, poor sales ultimately led them to pull back. However, that doesn't stop me from loving what this machine is all about. And to appreciate it in the best possible way, let's figure out what's wrong with this thing and go and fix it. Now, if you're familiar with us at Overclock Media, you might have seen Austin Evans do a segment on this in his Sendico video where he paid $170 at auction for it. Unfortunately, in that video, we found out that the disk drive doesn't work. It does boot up and show us the XMB, but unfortunately, as a PS2 in its current state, it is not working. Inside of here, there are two lasers. The first one is a standard DVD reader, which also burns discs as well. But what this standard laser does is verify what kind of disc gets inserted into the PSX. And if it realizes that a PlayStation game is inserted, then it'll fire up the second laser, which is more akin to one that you'd find on an actual PS2. My working hypothesis right now is that the first laser, the one that does all of that verification 
to tell the PSX what kind of disc you have in here is the one that's failing since we couldn't even get a DVD video to load up. So I'm gonna take this thing apart and we'll try to do some surgery. We need a donor. And this right here is a period correct DVD burner from 2004. What's really annoying about the PSX is that it's pretty finicky if you need to do any repairs or replacements on it. The disc drive replacement actually requires specific lasers that are typically found in burners like this from 2004 from Sony or light on drives from PowerBook G5s. Those are the only two places that you can find them. Luckily, there were a handful of posts on Reddit and some PlayStation forums of people working on their PSX, which proved helpful for preparing for this video. However, for the sake of the content, I want to go in a little blind. There's a huge part of me that wants to be surprised with what the PSX has in store, though hopefully I won't regret this. So I think I'm just gonna jump right in. So let's open up the PSX over here. In theory, one laser should look identical to the one on my burner, and that's the one I'm going to be taking out. I'm kind of intimidated by opening up a PSX because I haven't even opened up a PS2, much less a special PS2. After playing what seemed like whack-a-mole, undoing a bunch of screws under the PSX, so smelled a little bit like Grandma Agnes in there. Next time, Grandpa Charles should stay in the urn. Ugh, ugh. Okay, well, maybe I shouldn't spend time cleaning it now if we don't even know what the condition of this console is. Where do, where, I wanna put my dust bunny somewhere. <laughs> okay, well, at least the actual component parts look pretty clean, actually. Uh, let's see if we can hone in on our disk drive. Yeah, buddy. It took a little bit to figure out how to get the covers off of the PSX. That is the power supply, let's not touch that. But eventually. All right, and our PSX is opened up. We have our disk drive over here, the power supply, which we certainly will not touch. And we also have our hard drive. We're not gonna touch that, but I do want to note that these things are also a ticking time bomb. These things are actually firmware locked, so you actually need to source other drives from a PSX in order to have them work with this machine. So if a drive goes wrong, on your PSX, it's not the easiest thing to replace as well. So I want to uh, do some backups and stuff and make sure that if this thing dies, my PSX isn't just DOA or not dead on arrival, it'd be uh, dead again. No, dead, <laughs> just dead. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless, let's get to our disk drive. How? Bum, 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 bum. What made the PSX particularly hard to deal with was the annoying amount of screws hidden in plain sight. It's clear that Sony didn't want you messing around with this console whatsoever. But eventually, the disk drive is free. Oh my God, there's so much dust. Okay, so the disk drive is out. Let's hope it wasn't for naught. Let's grab at these screws. Here we go. All right, if I had to hazard a guess, the big Sony one is the PlayStation one, and this is our first laser, the one that does all the verification. In order to find out though, let's take apart our donor drive and see what's in here. And here is our laser. So let's try to take this apart even further. I wanna actually free this. After some further disassembly, our donor drive is almost good to go. And I can confirm that the laser on this guy is the same as the one on our PSX. I'm really happy that that's the case because different versions of the PSX have different lasers that go to them as well. Now the only thing that I have to do is figure out how to do the transplant itself. And so I pushed further, I figured out out how to get the donor laser off its track. Hey, yo! I'm so smart. Then I was going to figure out how to get the laser off the PSX when something weird happened. Uh. What? There's an SD. There's an SD. What? What? Wait, what? Where? 
This thing does not have an SD card slot just buried in here, right? This is some, this is some shenanigans. What is happening? I swear to God, I did not contrive that. Literally, I just was like, what is rattling inside and an SD card fell out? Did someone insert an SD card into the drive bay by accident? It's just three files. It's literally, it's literally just some dude's renovation photos. What were they taking? In March of 2006. <laughs> Cool. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a thing. <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, when you pay $180 for a random PSX on Sendico that has no quality to speak of whatsoever, um, sometimes you will find random stuff. Yeah, it's a bonus buy. It, he, <laughs> Grandma Agnes and her house. <laughs> All right, but let's get back on track. We have a PSX to fix. All right, so we've separated the laser chassis, if you will, and there are these two retention screws that we have to take off that hold in our rails. It should be a cakewalk now. Rail off. Look at that. Isn't it cool when things work? There we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're good now. <sighs> Old laser. We're putting it off to the side. New laser. Let's put it in. This should just be as easy as sliding it back on. One rail only goes on a, the track properly, but then the other one is just kind of sitting on there, so sick. There we go. It is yeah. on there, all right. We're getting somewhere, okay, okay. All right, so ribbon cable is now in. This drive should be good to go. We did it. Well, we'll see if it works. <laughs> we have to reassemble it. Now at this point, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's a sprint to put the PSX all back together to find out if our efforts were all worth it. All right, so the PSX is mostly together. I haven't put the shells on yet because I want to make sure that it boots on and does everything we want it to do. Let's power it on and see if we did a good job or not, because I don't tear things apart that often. Hard drive spinning up, power is on. Let's make sure our TV is fired up. Video one. Not the best sign. Maybe it's doing some kind of reset. Let me plug into other RCAs and see if that is our problem. Nope, no video on that one. No video on that one either. Okay. Plugging in that ribbon cable at the top, it might need to make a circuit. So what that attaches to is this top plate. At this point, I'm willing to try anything to make this work. The other thing too is that this is annoying to put back on. You know what? I'm just gonna rest this on here. I'm not gonna properly seat it in case we have to get back into the console, but I think we should be good enough to plug this in again. Oh, okay. So we got some lights. So the ribbon cable is doing its thing. The light's static. Okay, 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 okay. So, hit the button. That's doing new stuff. Oh, let's go? Yeah. Bro? Okay. We're plugged into video. Nope. Oh. <laughs> Rookie mistake. Don't do it to me. Come on. Come on, man. This thing is clearly on. Okay, so I turn it off. Let me try to turn it on again. Yo! Hello? Okay, so we didn't royally break it. All we had to do was just turn it on and off, right? Arc. <laughs> well, when you say it like that, <laughs> you know, in hindsight, yes. That, yeah, we should have done that to begin with. Um, okay, but we have a loading screen here, so it is properly working. I want to get us into the XMB. <gasps> Wait. Oh, here we go. Okay. We have the XMB. Well, I'm still recording TV. Uh, let's try to play a DVD first. To test this, I have a CD and DVD here, but we'll just use the DVD. This is from one of my favorite J-pop artists, Supercell. Just be careful here. Let's put it in. Okay, well, the motor's not taking it. Oh, no. Please? Pretty please? Okay, well. Yeah, I don't think that's functioning. Oh, whatever we did, I think kind of messed with the motor. At the very least, the console still powers on. And I kind of do want to go back into the disk drive to see if we can repair the motor. For me, that's almost not worth it at this stage. 
I kind of want to count my blessings in that this console does work. All right, pause. You know when people say always trust your gut? Well, it turns out there's a reason for that. You see, shortly after this bit, I decided to open up the PSX again to see if I could rectify the situation with our disk drive. And things ended up taking a turn for the worst. Man, I spent way too long on this. It's like 9.45 in the evening. And I think I've hit the point where I've actually done the thing I didn't want to do, which is kill the console. This thing for some reason is not powering on anymore. And I think it's because I accidentally snagged one of the ribbon cables. It is just mangled to hell. And I tried to put it back in, but now it just won't power on. <sighs> Man, I should have just left it. I should have just left it the way it was. It also doesn't help that I was a big idiot and realized way too late on how to take off the side panels on here so that I could easily take the bottom and top shell off. Um, so I could have probably saved myself some hardware pain. I'm just not in a good spot. Ugh. For shame. <sighs> Fuck, man. While it's hard to say what specifically broke with our PSX, I at least for myself can learn a little more patience, care, and at least can be a little more prepared when it comes to taking apart consoles. There's no doubt that the PSX would have had a better shot at life otherwise. Also, with the benefit of hindsight, I think I could have switched around my order of operations. I was planning on doing software mods after fixing the disk drive, but I really should have done that before the hardware fix. In theory, that would have allowed me to force the PSX to try reading the PS2 discs directly instead of relying on that DVD verification. Of course, there's no way to tell if that would have worked, but it's frustrating that we'll never know. Okay, so we might have flopped trying to fix the PSX, but maybe working on this one will go over better? When the PlayStation Portable came out here in the United States in 2005, it was a highly anticipated device. Not only was it supposed to be a competitor to the original Nintendo DS, but it also promised to offer a lot of what the original PlayStation and PlayStation 2 had to offer in terms of titles, graphics, etc., but in your pocket. Now, this might be my rose-tinted nostalgia goggles talking, but I do think that the PSP, by the end of its life cycle, did offer a lot of what Sony was promising, and then some. I personally had a lot of fond memories as a kid playing Need for Speed Underground and Gran Turismo on this thing, especially since those were games that I played in my living room on my PS2, but could play them on the go even if they weren't quite the full version. However, more than anything else, growing up as a young tech enthusiast, I really loved just how much of a multimedia device the PSP really was. This right here is the PSP 3000, which came out a couple of years after the initial launch and compared to the original console, brought in a couple of improvements, namely with a brighter screen, a more streamlined design, and most importantly, more RAM in terms of performance. However, for this particular unit, it's been sitting around in the office for quite a while. In fact, I don't remember why we even got it or even the condition of it for that matter, apart from the fact that cosmetically, it has seen better days. There is a battery in here. I don't know if it's charged, but let's see if it even powers on. Oh, well, we got a power light. Ooh, the screen turns on. Ah yes, the good old XMB. Still holds up today, man. Seriously, one of the best interfaces Sony has ever made, more so than the PS4 and even the PS5. They really should go back to this old design. Now looking at the actual screen, there are a fair few surface scratches, though the panel itself is looking nice, which is good to see. But this body has certainly seen better days. There's a bunch of paint chipping over here, and the back has a lot of scrapes. This thing has taken quite a few falls over the years, for sure. Hell, even the plastic side rail is missing a piece, 
And some of our buttons definitely don't feel as springy as they used to. This circle button feels particularly flat and the shoulder buttons have a little bit of crust to them. So we're gonna have to replace a good amount of this PSP, but I think it is a good platform to start with. Now let's see if the UMD drive functions well, if at all. I think I just set the UMD in and close it. Oh, it's spinning up. It's making some laser noises, but uh, oh yeah, look at that. It works totally fine. And because this particular console is a Japanese model, the X and circle buttons are inverted for the interface. So to select, I have to hit circle, but that's totally fine because in theory, I believe these are region free. So it should be able to play my US version of Need for Speed Underground Rivals fine. Oh, making some loud ass noises though. Some squeaks. Is that normal? I mean, the game's running. I remember back in the day with my original PSP 1000 that the disc drive made a lot of noise, but man, I do not remember it being that loud. That's something I'll have to look into as well, though I'm sure it's fine if the game is reading. Woo! This works totally fine. Yep, D-pad works well, X works well. Yeah, I mean, this is this is pretty good. Let's play some Underground Rivals real quick. Oh yeah, this plays totally fine. Woo! Yeah, no, this is, this is good, okay. But yeah, while this console might not look the best, it certainly functions fine. So it will be a good base to do some refurbishing and maybe even some mods as well. So let me order some parts, figure out what I wanna actually do, and let's jump ahead to actually refurbishing this thing. Several months later. All right, so all of my parts came in from AliExpress. They're all splayed out on the table. Let's just get started with tearing down our PSP and properly refurbishing it. Now I could just wing it tearing down this console, but I found a helpful tutorial in my research for this video. I'll link it in the description. And I'm probably going to need it because there are some finicky bits that are probably fine to just dive in blind, but better safe than sorry, especially since I want to do this right, considering that some of my other projects haven't turned out quite so well. For some reason is not powering on anymore. And I think it's because I accidentally snagged one of the ribbon cables. Let's just dive right in here. So at least the first part seems pretty easy. Just a couple of screws gets our faceplate and stuff off. Whenever I do these teardowns, I feel like I always end up with a few extra screws than when I started, which isn't a good thing because then that means I didn't exactly put everything all together as nature intended. Outer screws are undone. And next up is a screw that's under the battery, though I guess someone had already gotten into this console because there are no screws back here. So now I'm wondering what the actual quality of this PSP is. Maybe Austin had worked on this thing before or something. So this faceplate does actually come off fairly easily, though I will be careful because there are things like foam seals, I think, that go around our screen, which we want to keep intact because I think we're gonna try to transplant some of these onto our replacement parts. And I also don't wanna break anything either. Even though most of, especially our shell, is not going to be used again, it would be nice to just preserve what I can in case we do actually need it down the line. What is holding you captive, sir? Oh, I'm dumb. Maybe you should undo all the screws first before you uh, assume that the console could be torn apart. So that wasn't all of the outer screws. I missed two of them because I'm just dumb. All right, now, we are free. And that all came apart very easily. That is an open PSP. So again, what I want to do with this PSP is replace more or less everything that isn't the core PCV. I'm gonna to have to really tear apart this whole entire thing bit by bit in order to make that happen. So let's just do it and carefully so I don't break anything. I'm gonna get some tweezers. So the first thing I'm gonna do is separate our home row buttons, which apparently just unclip. Oh yeah, it's kind of coming off. Okay. Okay. This is not boding well for me if I can't even do this most basic step this early in. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that's one side. Or is there, this is actually screwed in. Yeah, it was 100% screwed in, there we go. And so our home row buttons are completely off. I'm gonna set this to the side. We're gonna have a lot of components splayed out very quickly, so I'm going to try to organize as best as I can. I guess I can also take this time to remove our face buttons as well. It's always interesting to see how these things work because it's basically just some membrane and buttons and they just touch on a point 
that's closer to the board here. Looks like our shoulder buttons also naturally fell off. So I'm just gonna take these off. Not gonna lie, when I opened this up, things just started falling. Maybe I should be worried that the console is falling apart this easily. Maybe the person that opened this up did not take the best care when they did it, so. From here, it also looks like I can take off our screen, which is just on with a flex cable. So as long as I don't kink them or anything in a weird way, I think this process should be fairly straightforward. This is a very small device and therefore a lot of components that need to, to be finagled in here. All right, so our screen is off. Um, Cool, oh man, this ribbon cable I think belonged to our home row, so that's unfortunate. It didn't stay with our home row and I don't know if I'll be able to put that together. So far, things seem to go pretty smoothly. And as always with these teardowns, it's nice to see how even the simplest parts work. Oh, that's really cool. So I'm actually seeing how they did the power switch on the PSP. So it's actually this very, very small PCB that's connected via a flex cable to our motherboard. And there's a physical switch here that's spring loaded. Yeah, that is a very tiny board. <laughs> power switch is out. We're gonna put this on our right side. In fact, I'm gonna put this with our organizer here so I don't lose it. And then I have to take apart the actual power connector here. I don't think we have to actually take this out, but it's probably so more so that it's out of the way. Woo, nice. Our power connector is free. Put all of our power stuff in there. There are so many flex cables, man. So this is where our triangle, square, circle, X buttons touch to make an input. And uh, apparently this whole thing comes off, but we have to be careful to not kink it. Cool, easy. Oh, that's so interesting. So not only is it for the front facing buttons, but it's also for our shoulder as well. That's quite nice. Wow. Okay, so I think this is our Wi-Fi. At least it's a Wi-Fi-ish looking connector. So that seems like it'll be very easy to just take off. There's all this stuff on the left as well. Oh, that's what this is. It's our memory stick door. So it was missing the plastic piece on the side. I thought that was just the housing. Oh yeah, so yeah, of course, this had a memory stick already in it. Oh, it had a micro SD adapter with a 32 gig card in it. I had bought one thinking that I was using the internal memory. Cool, well, I have two of these now. To be fair, it has been a while since I've actually interacted with a PSP to begin with, so. Okay, so all of this seemingly just kind of comes off. There's a flex cable over here that I should be careful to not f up. Boom. Hell yeah. Okay, so this will possibly make our reassembly a little easier. At what point can I take out this whole middle core? Awesome, so this ribbon cable over here that I just took off is for our UMD drive, which I am going to replace. We'll see how easy or laborious that is. I'm probably leaning toward the ladder because we do have to get our soldering kit out as you will see in a moment. But again, since I'm tearing it into pieces anyway, there's no reason not to. Because we want to replace not only the outer shell of our PSP, but also our incredibly scuffed chassis, we have to unmount literally everything from the console. That said, apart from even more encounters with my personal kryptonite, also has a flex cable, God damn it, and a little bit of destruction, well, it doesn't matter if I break it because we're replacing it anyway. Well, I bent that whole piece of plastic, but again, we don't need it. The process was more or less straightforward. Hello? Okay, well, I was following the tutorial, but sometimes I don't do that. Huh. Is it supposed to do that? Oh, uh, was it supposed to do that? I think this is the speaker. I just took out the speaker. Was I supposed to do that? Uh, oh, I see, okay. So these leaf style connectors actually make contact with these two connectors on our board, which is really neat. I will take that as a cautionary tale to hug the tutorial even more as we go down further in the process. <sighs> wow, look at that. That is our whole PSP motherboard, or at least most of it. Yeah, that is pretty small, I'd say. Next, I needed to take off the UMD door on the back. How? Which so far is looking to be the most labor intensive part. It involves removing itty bitty pieces of plastic and metal, which will absolutely be a pain to put back in. But then I realized something. Do I actually have to do all of this? I certainly have to take out my Wi-Fi board, which I think this is what that is. But other 
other than that, this can just stay on the old assembly and I could just put my new drive on the new shell and save myself some time. So I guess now is a better time than ever to take a look at some of our transplant parts. So here is our UMD drive, which I'll get to in a moment, but also we should probably take a look at our donor shell. Okay, so we will have to transplant a lot of the old assembly from our old donor PSP, like the spring for the door and whatnot. Not, but yeah, this don't look too bad. First things first, we need to take out the UMD door. <gasps> there we go, okay, 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 okay. We're good, we're free. And I guess we start transplanting stuff back in. So the main thing I have to do right now is get this new UMD drive mounted onto the core of our new PSP shell kit. But before I jump in and do that, something to note when you do a proper drive replacement is there is an anti-static solder joint usually on these things from the get-go. And it is crucial for you to take this off before you properly plug all of this in to your old hardware. Otherwise, the drive itself won't work. Now, in order for me to do this, I need to clear some space and grab our soldering stuff because otherwise that solder joint is not gonna come off. Okay, so I have my soldering station here. I'm gonna heat it up. But the idea behind what I'm doing here is fairly simple. Essentially, we just have to desolder this anti-static joint over here and that is it. So what is the problem? proper way of doing this without a proper soldering surface. Um, what is the lesser of evils? I don't think I should do it on the mouse pad because that'll definitely light on fire. I'm tempted to say I'm gonna do it on the wood. I'm gonna do it on the wood. We went from following the rules to pure chaos in a matter of seconds. Again, kids, do as I say, not as I do. Um, this is a bad idea. Here goes nothing. Let's uh, hope to God this works. Oh, wait, that was quick. That was very quick. Oh, it did it. It did it, it did it, it did it. Um, I might need to do a little more. That's very hard to see on camera, but it actually just picked up all of the solder there. And I think I might have to do a little bit more, but uh, we are close. We are close, wow. I think that's it. Let me examine the work. And the best reference point I have is the actual drive that came on our original PSP. I mean, that looks the same. Okay, I mean, I don't know if it works yet because we haven't exactly tested it, but that looks pretty much the same. Either this was really easy or something went horribly wrong. How bad can it be? How desoldered does it actually have to be? Oh. No, 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 I, 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 see, I see the difference, I see the difference. It is very hard to get, in fact, I'm just gonna take a photo of this on my iPhone with a macro lens. So you can actually see on the flex connector, there are a bunch of different lines which run to the pins at the end of the flex connector. And the desolder joint essentially acts as a wall to stop the signal going through to the end of the connector, which means in order for it to work, you need to see the line flat out, make it from one end of the cable to the other, through the joint, which now that I'm looking at it is not quite there. So let me do a little more work here. That might be it. That might be it. Uh, that looks like a straight line. I'm gonna do one more. It's more of a sanity check. Yeah, I think I'll call that good. Ideally you're using a magnifying glass for this, but I have very good eyes even though I'm wearing glasses. Yeah, dude, I think we did it. We didn't need those fancy tools at all. I'm feeling confident with this. The hard stuff is out of the way. The rest of it is just putting back what I tore apart. Uh, I'm feeling happy now, but watch it not work. Watch it not work. <laughs> Cautious optimism aside, I pushed along. The UMD door was a pain to sort out as expected, but eventually I figured it out. I put our motherboard back into place, all of the cables and connectors for our power as well as the buttons. Honestly, it felt as straightforward as the teardown itself. Short of these stupid ribbon cables again. Okay, well maybe that wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. That's what she said. Okay, 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 cool. And down. Sick. <laughs> And the final cable before we move on to the next step is the UMD drive flex cable, which actually doesn't look too bad because the cable is quite large. Gotta like wiggle it in, make sure that it's properly seated. You could do a little test. And that is in there, my friends, yes. All right, the hard stuff is finally past us. It's time to just put our head down and get the reassembly really going. 
Eventually, I got our screen and the power all reconnected. Though, before I sprint to the finish, let's plug in our AC adapter and check our work to make sure that the screen is all good. And turn it on. Oh, we got a light. Okay, that's not good. We have some, uh, some screen issues there, which are most certainly my doing. We know that the PSP works, just not optimally. What is wrong here? What, uh, what, what, what I do? What I do? I am quite scared. I mean, I did put a little bit of pressure on the flex cable, but not much. It can't be that bad, right? Okay, we'll try it one more time. So at least we know that our power button works. Our screen up. I mean, that's not the worst thing in the world. Like they only cost like $15, which I mean, it sucks that I have to buy another one, but uh, really? What could have possibly went wrong? I mean, it's not like I'm the most careful person, but I did try to baby it a little bit. What happened here? <laughs> Not to remedy the screen, but while I'm here and testing things, I'm gonna take out our new set of buttons because if I'm gonna be ordering some extra spare parts, I should at least look into what is actually working for me right now. So I'm gonna put our membrane buttons on here. Okay, so they do work. Testing the directional pad, totally fine as well. So the transplant worked as intended. We'll obviously get the placement of these things actually right, but it's good to see that that stuff works. The main thing I need to do now is get a new screen for this guy. There's a part of me that's impatient and wants to finish this part of the project today. Well, let's go on, let's go on a journey. <laughs> so as no surprise to probably no one, Overclock Media has a bunch of PlayStations. Hopefully we have a PSP 3000 here that I could use to help the cause, which is to fix my PSP. I'm gonna try to see what's inside of this one here. Maybe this could be our donor. Survey says, not gonna lie, that's actually kind of all right. Mmm, mmm. Is Austin here? Hello. Hi. I have a question. At this point, I want Boss Man to bite if I have any shot of finishing this today. After all, it already took my components a month to show up. I don't have another month to work on this video. Woo! No. Before, before you jump oh, to you conclusion- you didn't mod that one. That's the one we already have that you want to tear apart right now because you broke it. Did I get it right the first time? Partially, yes. What'd you break? I need a new screen. Why? So the screen that I have on it right now, uh -huh. the one that we fixed, yeah. is if we're going by pixels, is half working. So you have half your pixels working? Yes. Couldn't you just buy like a third party, nicer, upgraded LCD display? Yes. Are you too lazy to wait for Amazon to show up with prime shipping with that display? Yes. So instead you're gonna tear apart a perfectly good PSP just to steal the screen out of it? Yes. That's your pitch? Tell him he's wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong and you're dumb. He wants to tear apart a PSP because he broke a screen, so he wants another screen. Wow. Oh, it's so easy. I'll just be able to do it's it. Easy. It's easy. easy. I don't need any help. As it stands, yep. it is all in. So this is the original display? This is the original display. Yeah. Did it as best as I could. I mean- Are you sure it's fully seated in there? I reseated it twice and it does the same exact thing. I'll show you what it does. Oh, it's like interlace. Yeah. I, I, as I said, half my pixels work. Ship it. Why not? Ship? What, what do you mean ship well, how it? How do you know that? But how do you know it's a screen though? Is because look at, the, look at the bottom. The bottom's fine. Oh no, yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you as someone that has used this for at least an hour, I'll tell you that that's not the way it. Well, yeah, I know it's not supposed yeah. to look like that. Yeah. Well, I certainly might seem a bit lazy, not even wanting to use Amazon Prime. The replacement screens on there might be of dubious quality. PSP three thousand. Thank you videos are getting very expensive lately. Thirty bucks. Two stars on Amazon. Are you kidding me? I don't. I'm not gonna trust that for a second. What, what, are, what are the ratings on this? It's in Spanish. I don't know what it says. Kelly Dad. De de defectuosa. Okay, that's that's that that pro bad. that's probably Spanish for defective. That's probably accurate. I can <laughs> like, believe that. After promising Austin I'd get a replacement screen to replace our replacement. Fine. And I promise I won't break the new one. Mm-hmm. Likely story. For the sake of the content, we are going to do it this way, but obviously don't ruin PSPs just to fix them. 
Do as I say, not as I do, right? Now that I'm an expert PSP opener, it only took a few moments to get our donor console open and our new slash used screen free. Screen is free. Okay, 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 okay. So I pushed forward, hopped it over onto our refurbished PSP, and then, okay, we're good. <laughs> So it was a screen problem. So I think if I had to hazard a guess, what went wrong with the other screen versus what I just did was, surprise, surprise, this flex cable right here is very delicate. It's super thin, and I probably just hit it in a weird way when I was trying to finagle it into place. Probably scratched it a little too much, and the little leads on here probably just, I don't know, got kinked to a point where they just don't work anymore. It's a shame, but at the very least, we got a working screen now, and most importantly, uh, nothing else is broken. However, just as I fixed one problem, another one had emerged, and this one kind of hurts. Just when I thought things were going fine, I've run into a major issue. There's a UMD in here, it is spinning, but it sounds like the drive is having issues reading the game. There's almost this rhythmic pattern to its scanning and it's just not doing anything at all. Could it be the solder joint? Oh man, I don't know. That's really hard to diagnose. In any case, that's certainly not normal. Okay, so from this point, I think there are a few ways that I can proceed. One, I can undo a lot of the work that I just did, which I don't think is a lot. It'd just be time consuming more than anything. I can also take out our new UMD drive and put in the old one that I know works, albeit it is loud, or I can be lazy and just commit to the fact that inevitably I'm going to have to install software mods on this anyway and will be running ROMs because I will 100% be doing that over playing UMD games anyway. I mean, it's not that much work. The thing is, I really only have one UMD that I'm going to play on this thing, and it's the one that I grew up with, Need for Speed Rivals. But I could just get a ROM of this and play it on the memory stick and it'd be totally fine. I need to make a decision quick. Uh, oh my God, ah. Oh. Three days later. At long last, here is the finished product. My refurbished PSP 3000. And I think it looks pretty sharp. I'm happy that I went with the translucent green. It's a great pop of color. The white buttons on the front add some good contrast to break things up a bit. And while I'm going back and forth on whether or not I like these red shoulder buttons, because it makes the color scheme look a bit like Christmas, I'll say that how the color actually appears through the transparent plastic is cool. It almost looks like taillights on a car. Beyond the color, this shell from AliExpress is actually very high quality, at least on the exterior details. I specifically chose this one because all of the logos and engravings on it look properly OEM, at least from the website. And yeah, in person, it does look very spot on. Transplanting the components onto this new shell did require some minor improvisation here and there since it wasn't 100% like the Sony shell, but it is par for the course with third-party parts Parts like this, especially since the PSP has been discontinued for quite a while. And even still, the fit and finish on this looks really nice. Now, if you look at the back here, you might notice that there is no UMD inserted. And that's because I've decided to turn a blind eye to my driver placement issues, lean into the failure, and proceed without looking back. While it sucks that the console isn't fully functioning so that I can play Need for Speed Underground like nature intended, I'd rather not tempt fate by doing a secondary deep teardown to trace the problem when I otherwise have a working functioning console. And honestly, this is a far cry from being the end of the world. For one, I can move on knowing that our original UMD drive that came with this PSP should in fact still work, perhaps with a little bit of elbow grease and actual 
grease. Lathering up the components in there should remedy most of the egregious screeching noises that I heard a few weeks ago. Secondly, I also have the other donor PSP that Austin lent me that also does have a confirmed UMD drive working as well that I could swap in to this console. But really, the huff of copium here is that I've installed custom firmware so that I can play whatever games I want right from the memory card. Man, I haven't done this maybe since like high school with my PSP 1000, but compared to back then, hacking a PSP these days is so easy. I'll link the guides I used in the description below, but it took me all of like two minutes to do, and now I am able to load all of the old ISOs that I've had sitting around in cold storage for at least over a decade. Using a micro SD card to memory stick duo adapter, as well as a fast micro SD card, you can dump tons of games on here in no time. That being said, it's really awesome that I can get back to some very nostalgic titles, such as Project Diva Extend, which is probably one of the first games I played in my anime fandom. This was essentially a very bare bones rhythm game with a lot of really cool music. And I gotta say, the new screen that we installed here looks miles better than the old one that we were dealing with, even though I did probably break something in the reinstallation of the old screen. This one isn't flickering, the color is way better. So I think even if I did put it in right, it was probably going to go out at some point. So I'm happy that we did a screen replacement. Oh man, I still got it. And a game like this is really good to test our buttons as well, because a lot of it is dependent on timing, though I'm not doing great right now because I'm talking to camera. But um, our buttons feel really good, especially for a lot of the notes that require you to press both the D-pad and the interface buttons. So I'm actually really happy with how all of that turned out. We didn't really break any of the inputs in the process, which is one of the things that I was worried about, though I guess there's not really much to mess up, but you never know. Another game that I played a lot growing up on the PSP was Gran Turismo. Now, it's been a while, and there have been a bunch of entries in the series since this one has come out to the point where I honestly don't remember it a whole lot, but I imagine a game like Gran Turismo, which has decent graphics traditionally, would also be a great way to see how our screen is. And oh my god, look at all of these courses! The throwbacks! Wow! <laughs> <laughs> Let's do Trial Mountain. This is the one that I absolutely played the most. Oh yeah, that is definitely Trial Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Man, the graphics that you can get on the PSP are seriously impressive for the time. I mean, while the goal was to make a PS2, but in your pocket, it's certainly not PS2 graphics, but man, for something that you can play like on your commute to work or to school, man, this is nice. Look at all of the lighting effects. The 3D looks seriously nice too. Sony was really onto something with this console back in the early 2000s. And also, while we're talking about the graphics, I do like the way that our new screen looks. Actually, looking at it, the only gripe that I have with this shell that we bought off of AliExpress is that, and I didn't really notice it before, but there is a nick on the inner side of our screen lens. If I pull up our PS quit menu here, it almost kind of looks like a speck of dust, but that's actually just a nick. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a shame that that's there, but also when you're in the heat of gameplay, it's hardly noticeable, especially at full brightness. Downloading custom firmware on your PSP allows you to play a bunch of different games, but there were also a lot of wacky applications that existed on both UMD and on the PSN store that added a bit of convenience to your life, especially with add-on accessories like this GPS module, which I was able to buy with the box in 2024. Plus, I was able to find a navigation app that apparently still works some 15 to 20 years after release, and so we are going to try to navigate around town using this GPS module and my new PSP. In 2024! What? <laughs> All right, so we are in the company car and I have our PSP set up with the GPS module and Go Explore, which is our navigation app. So the idea here is that we can actually use this to get from point A to point B with turn-by-turn -turn directions and whatnot. And supposedly, all the GPS stuff still works. So let's try it out. 
Ah, the classic PSP sound. Wow, that is very 2008. <laughs> <laughs> now, in doing my research with this, the only issue with Go Explore is that the actual points of interest are still locked to like 2008 or 2009. Just keeping that in mind, you probably won't find your newest boba spot around the corner or anything like that. But as long as the business has existed for like 10 or 15 years, it's probably in here. Well, first of all, let's just look at the map and see what that looks like. Yeah, just standard GPS. I don't like, I don't know what else I was expecting here. So I can change my view here we have a bird's eye one right now if i hit square it's more of a pov if you will which i think will actually center itself once we start navigating yeah i mean let's just go find some points of interest and navigate pretty sure they had best buys back then oh they absolutely did best buy the first one that shows up is the one that's probably a couple of exits away on the freeway hit go and there we are let's just set off and uh see how well this go explore app actually is Oh, okay. So there are not only turn by turn directions, but a very pleasant sounding British lady is telling us where to go as well. Cheerio. Oh, <laughs> yeah, this looks so proper. And we get voice turn by turn directions too. Yo. Thank you. Oh, was I not supposed to do that? I think I, I just didn't listen to it. I misunderstood what it wanted. All right, it wanted us to go on the freeway. And I'll be real, like the speed that it's reading on here is pretty accurate to what I'm seeing on my speedometer. So is the PSP GPS module and Go Explore actually usable in 2024? Surprisingly, yes. Something else cool that I found is if you go into the settings and hit GPS, It'll actually give you a readout of the satellites it's connecting to and kind of the connection status, as well as your altitude or elevation and the speed that you're traveling with as well. The level of information you get might not be as robust, but it's still really surprising how much it actually gives you in terms of accuracy and information. Apparently we are 161 yards over sea level. <laughs> Why is it in yards? So the GPS module retailed, I think in Japan for around 6,000 yen, which is about in at least today's dollars, which is not what it was before, is roughly around 50 bucks. Same thing can be said about the Go Explore application. I bought the UMD. I paid about $60 for that. And a lot of that was really shipping from Europe because uh, I had to import it. So for like $110, should you go out and buy a PSP navigation device for your actual daily use? Probably not. But I think as a novelty, I mean, come on, this thing is kind of rad, right? <laughs> Oh man, yeah, this is actually doing it. The Best Buy is literally up ahead. Hey, yo, hey, it's right here. I overshot the entrance. Talk about the most 2008 thing that I've done in a long time. We navigated to Best Buy on my PSP using a PSP GPS module in a 2018 Toyota 4Runner that might as well be a 2008 4Runner because they never really changed. The only thing I have to do now is buy like a Nokia or something in here and it will be all set. Yo, dang, this was an interesting experience. This is wild. The fact that there's something connectivity related on the PSP that still works in this day and age is honestly a blessing. Obviously this console has been long out of support from Sony. And most importantly, I was trying to connect over Wi-Fi to the networks over in the studio and it would not connect to anything. So the fact that I can actually access GPS satellites here in 2024 is probably the most, I don't even know how to describe it. I'm just, I'm just dumbfounded that it works. It, there's no reason why I wouldn't, but it still does. And that makes me very happy. Fine, fine. I'm done with the amateur repairs, but check out this PlayStation TV that you probably have never seen before. This is the Sony Bravia KDL 22 PX300. At a quick glance, nothing seems too out of the ordinary with this TV, but right here in this rather thick looking base, is an entire PlayStation 2 built right in. In the past, Sony had quite the knack for making quirky iterations of their game consoles. We took a look at the PSX a couple of months ago, which was this quirky offshoot of the PS2 that was part game console, part media box, 
part set-top box for satellite TV service, and also part DVR. And that system was never sold outside of Japan. There was also the PlayStation TV, which was basically a PS Vita minus the screen that you could connect to a TV to make it an affordable pseudo home console. And that device bore no relation to the actual PlayStation TV, which was a standalone display, but designed to pair perfectly with the PlayStation 3 and its 3D capabilities. As you can probably already tell, Sony and product names go together like peanut butter and ketchup. However, this product right here, the KDL22PX300, while not directly marketed as a PlayStation TV, it probably deserved the name way more than the others. But how did this product even come about? Now, interestingly enough, this product was released exclusively in the UK in 2010 through a fairly big electronics chain called Richer Sounds to the tune of about 200 pounds or about 300 US dollars at the time, which was actually kind of a deal when you consider what you're getting here. The store worked directly with Sony to combine one of the most popular entry-level TVs at the time, the 22BX300, which, mind you, cost like 250 bucks in the US, with the ever-popular PlayStation 2, with parts that Sony probably had lying around already. After all, that console saw production through 2013, seven years after the release of the PlayStation 3. The value proposition here was actually kinda awesome, almost like a gamer version of one of those combination TV-VCR combo sets back in the day. And best of all, the actual TV part of this package actually brought in some quality of life ads that the standard base Bravia didn't have, namely that it had a better selection of inputs. We are talking four HDMI ports, which is crazy for an entry-level TV of this time, three USB-A's, VGA to plug into a computer as a monitor, composite, component, as well as S-Card, which is basically European HDMI before they inevitably adopted HDMI themselves. All of this in a TV that uses PAL broadcast standard, which means the PS2 is in fact region locked, and this unit also needs a voltage conversion to work with my Freedom American power, brother. Discounting the regional pain points here, that is a lot of inputs, which is nice to see in a seemingly gamer-focused TV. Plus, something else that also surprised me about this TV in doing research about it was that at a time, it was able to connect to the internet to access some kind of Bravia service that also let it access things like IPTV channels and even YouTube, predating the popularity of smart TVs by a few years. In fact, if I grab the remote here, this TV actually uses the cross media bar as its primary user interface. And you can actually use this to go between external inputs, you can use it to change channels on your TV tuner, and apart from other media stuff, also use it to access your settings. If you've been watching the channel for a while now, you know I love this interface to death, and it's great to have it on this Sony Bravia too. Now, if I have a bone to pick with this PlayStation TV, it's actually kind of small for my liking. This is the kind of screen that you would typically see in like a dorm room or something at 22 inches diagonally. At least if you're watching stuff through HDMI, it does have a 720p native resolution, which does look sharp for the size, but it was definitely not something fit for, say, the average living room. Otherwise, this thing is seriously awesome, and I'm kind of flabbergasted at how great a condition it's actually in. It works! Oh man, these sounds are so nostalgic. Let's go. Man, this takes me so back. I spent probably hundreds of hours playing Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition growing up. I almost wish I had my game save because I customized some crazy cars back in the day. I mean, Dub Edition was really at a time when Hit My Ride was a thing and we threw spinning rims 
on like everything that moved, you too can be Brian O'Connor's tearing up the streets of California. Oh man. <laughs> You gotta love the sound effects. The graphics are actually pretty decent. And even though the physics are a bit arcadey, that was kind of the vibe in like the mid 2000s with Fast and the Furious and all of the weaving and diving that you would do throughout town. I gotta say, revisiting this game in 2024, I also forgot just how big this map was like the scale is absolutely enormous even by 2024 standards as i crash into vehicles <laughs> take two seriously needs to bring back this franchise it probably won't do super well but oh my god this was truly one of my favorite racing games of the era kia boys kia boys kia boys <laughs> Hello. Are you okay? I'm playing PS2. Are you having a great time? I am! I'm listening to Drum and Bass in Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition. Alright. Kia boys! Have fun. Bye, Austin. <laughs> oh man, I'm having such a good time. <laughs> this is why I love taking a look at old game console tech. Dude, it just gets me to relive all of my childhood memories. All of this formative tech and gaming hardware in my life, I get to revisit it all again. This is what it's all about. But yeah, gameplay aside, essentially this is a PS2 with very minimal compromises. You have a full disk drive that'll play PS1 games and DVDs. Fun fact, it actually opens up like a good old PlayStation 3 Super Slim that came way after this. You also got two memory card slots, two controller ports, two USB-A ports, on the front as well as ethernet on the back for network play and even an output for optical audio more or less a full-fledged ps2 right at the base of this bravia tv shoot this thing is awesome Another game that I spent a lot of time playing as a kid on my PlayStation 2 was SOCOM US Navy SEALs, in particular, the second installment in this franchise. I'm gonna sneak around here. I see two bad guys. Oh, gotta, gotta, gotta crouch, gotta crouch. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Man, I'll say that playing in standard resolution when you're so used to playing games in 1080p, 1440, or 4K, it is quite the difference compared to standard definition when an enemy is like a small blip on your screen. It definitely makes for harder aiming when you have to squint to see your enemies. No, I lost the mission! Oh, I got him though, I got him though. Beware of snippers. Ah! Where? Oh, here we go, here we go. There's a guy here, there's a guy here. Can I hit him from here? Oh, jeez. Where's the snipper? Where's the snipper? Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. I died. <laughs> He's dead. I deaded him. However, with regards to this TV, something that I wish that it could do, especially considering that it came out well after the PS2, we're talking almost a generation of game consoles apart, is that I wish that it could actually upscale the PS2, considering that it is built in to the TV hardware, at least somewhat. At this point in time, upscaling from SD to HD was relatively common, though I could understand with the fact that this is basically basically an entry level TV with a PS2 built in. Maybe that's too high end a feature to include on something like this, but it would have been nice either way. Looking around this TV, there isn't really much to speak of in the way of damage outside of the normal wear and tear that a 14 year old TV would go through. There are some scratches here and there on the shiny piano black plastic bezel as well as on our PS2 base here, but otherwise it is in very, very good condition. And I'm particularly happy about that, especially considering that we got one of the cheapest listings on eBay right now for this particular TV. That being said, it did cost us 700 US dollars as we had to import it from a seller 
from Belgium. And that's a pretty considerable markup considering that 14 years ago this thing cost 300 US dollars. But these TVs are starting to become more and more rare. And in the past, you were able to find it for maybe 500 bucks, but these things are seriously, seriously hard to find for under a grand. In fact, a lot of the listings that I found were hitting close to 2,500 and even five to $6,000 for one complete in box, which is insane. Insane. Another reason why I'm happy about the quality of this particular TV that we got is because the way that this thing was packed on its way to America was not the best. We actually did a full unboxing of it over on the Austin Evans channel for Mystery Tech. Definitely go check that out if you wanna see more of this TV. But uh, let's just say this thing was floating around in the box a bit on its way direct from Belgium. So I'm kind of surprised that it actually showed up here all in one piece in the way that I saw it in the original listing sight unseen. The only thing I really needed to pick up after the fact was this third party remote since this particular TV didn't come with it in the box. And I'm actually happy that I did because this makes navigating that XMB so much easier. Speaking of Sony, back in the day, they were quite known for making gadgets that were quirky and unique. And this right here is one of them, the smallest laptop they've ever made. This tiny little machine is one of my favorite laptops ever. It's called the Vio P and it was very ahead of its time, although probably too much so for its own good. In this video, I want to discuss what this particular device was all about and to see what it's like to actually use one in 2024. So let's jump right in. The Vio P came out in 2009, right at a turning point in the laptop space. Back then, notebooks were generally bulky, power hungry, and even if you had the occasional outlier that was sleek, those were also incredibly expensive. However, the late 2000s brought brought in the age of the netbook, a product category that grew wildly popular thanks to Intel's release of a low wattage chip called the Intel Atom. While these machines couldn't hold a candle to larger ones in terms of performance, they were perfect for things like word processing, Excel spreadsheets, and simple web browsing, which actually met the needs of most people. However, most importantly, these devices were also very affordable. We're talking anywhere between the $200 to $600 range in a landscape where traditional machines could easily cost Double. Growing up, I actually owned a Gen 1 Asus EPC that cost us about $300 back in the day. And while it ran a bare bones build of Linux and was incredibly slow with its 512 megabytes of RAM, it was absolutely perfect for things like taking notes in class. Not only that, but it worked so well for me at school that my teachers were also very on board to the point where they actually got the whole school to buy a fleet of them since they were so cheap. I hold very strongly that netbooks walked so Chromebooks could run. Put that on my tombstone. Why am I dying? <laughs> The popularity that netbooks saw ultimately led to faster developments in the space on both the hardware and software side, allowing for more performance, better battery life, and optimizations in key areas such as video playback when it comes to later iterations of these devices, which ultimately led us to the Vio P. Although as you'll find out, this thing was far, far, far from fast. The Vio Penis is real, no. <laughs> Nope, 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 nope. We can't say that on YouTube. <laughs> Now, I should preface that we actually looked at this on the Austin Evans channel a couple of years ago, but it's been so long since then, and I have no recollection of how well this thing actually worked. So, we just open it up. God, I love the form factor of this. It is so small. Let me power it on and see if it works. Oh, the screen is on. The screen doesn't look half bad. I mean, the viewing angles are awful, but uh, considering that this is just a normal TFT LCD from 2009, yeah, man, text look totally fine. You can see all of this load in very sharp resolution for this very tiny screen. That doesn't sound right. All of this load? 
Mm. I'll, no, don't don't put words in my mouth. That's what you said. No, I absolutely did not say that. No, I did not. What did you say? I don't know what I said. <laughs> Now, originally the Vio P was shipped running Windows Vista Basic, but here it seems like we worked on it because it is running Windows 10, which might actually be a problem because I think that this operating system might be a bit too clunky for the hardware that this particular laptop is equipped with. We're talking, uh, if I go into our task manager, which is taking forever to load, uh, Bro, this is taking forever. I'm just trying to, you know, control all delete here. Come on. I'm just trying to do basic things right now. When I say that netbooks weren't fast, I wasn't kidding. This one in particular was probably one of the worst of the bunch. We're talking single core Intel Atom for 2009 and like two gigs of RAM. You can't even open up Task Manager quick. Also, if you hear a bunch of growling coming out of this computer, that is actually the physical hard drive. We're talking a 1.8 inch 60 gig drive that actually is spinning and mechanical. It's not an SSD, it's not EMMC or anything like that. That was pretty common on netbooks. No, this is just a standard spinning mechanical drive, which is probably adding to the sluggishness of this system. Not only that, but we are literally 97% usage on our disk in terms of bandwidth and 61% on our CPU you just by doing nothing. <laughs> Bro, this thing is so slow. But let me talk about what I actually like about this, which is the form factor and the way that it is built. Man, I seriously love the form factor of the Vio P, especially how wide it is because it completely departs from the normal design of a laptop, especially without a trackpad here. What this means is that it relies on a little nubbins in the middle to navigate around windows. And you also have your mouse buttons on the bottom, which wouldn't seem that comfortable, at least looking at it from a distance, but actually using it, this is surprisingly intuitive. And I must say that this particular Vio P actually is in decent condition. Turning on the screen, I think there is one stray hotspot on here, but otherwise it looks really nice. I'm kind of surprised that there are no outstanding blemishes on here. I mean, certainly things that are wear and tear, like maybe some scratches here and there, but at least from a distance, man, this thing looks clean. Actually looking at it, the port selection on here is also rather interesting. So you have the standard, you know, two USB-A ports on here, as well as a headphone jack and a barrel connector for your power. But we also have, I don't know if this is proprietary, but we have a non-standard port here on the side, which I imagine will probably be for things like video out. Is that a lanyard? No, that's not for a lanyard, is it? For a lanyard? You're gonna wear this on your neck? That's like a mini Lexington port. Look at that. I think that's exactly what that is. Dang, I didn't know they made a mini version of that. Either that or that's just a random hole on the side of this laptop. <laughs> Oh, it's so useful. So, it's so useful. Or good job, Sony. You put more holes in here that wasn't necessary. And also because it is a Sony product from 2009, it can't go without a memory stick duo slot. Cause Sony things. Though pretty helpfully, there is an SD card slot here as well for you normal people out there. And also something interesting is that this is definitely a Vio P that came straight from Japan. You can actually tell because it has our hiragana characters on the keyboard, which is actually kind of cool. In fact, you have a little button here to switch from katakana, hiragana, and romaji. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm such a dumbass. How could I not talk about the best part about this laptop? The fact that it has A removable battery, yeah, repairability, 2100 milliamps, 16 watt hour. Ah, oh, that's not a lot. <laughs> I think Sony said that this would last somewhere in the neighborhood of three to three and a half hours on a single charge. Even for a laptop back in the day, that was, uh, that was, that was kind of nothing. Wow, look at this old ass Microsoft sticker for Windows Vista Basic. Wow. Oh, it has a product key. So if you uh, want to install it using my product key, there you go. Will the battery actually hold a charge? So this has been plugged in for I think about two hours now. And uh, what's not filling me with confidence is when I hit 
the battery icon here, it says 0%. So uh, something's definitely a miss here. If I just uh, unplug it, yep, we killed it. Okay, so the battery does not hold a charge, but at least it does take power. Let me actually spend a little more time getting this VIOP set up. I want to use it a bit more. Might do some software tweaks here. I got some ideas on how I can make this a little better and more ideal to use. And I'll be back with some thoughts. All right, I spent some time using the VIOP and my experience has been, let's just say, interesting. First of all, I ended up bypassing the original Windows 10 install on here in favor of running this custom lightweight and portable version called Tiny 10, which gets rid of a lot of the bloat that causes normal Windows 10 to chug on these machines. Now do note that we lose out on official updates from Microsoft, which means there are security risks here to be aware of if you do decide to also do the same thing on old machines you have lying around in your house. So I wouldn't recommend this for serious use long-term. However, for the sake of short-term novelty of trying out this tiny and awesome looking laptop, why not? right? Well, the unfortunate thing is that even with Tiny 10, this VIOP is still painfully slow. Quite literally, the simplest tasks of today, like opening up Edge or running Spotify, throws the CPU into 100% usage, leaving the computer hanging for chunks of annoying time. And boy, does it get this computer hot. Now, I certainly have no doubts that I could be experiencing some bottlenecks by running a portable version of Windows off of a USB stick, and that maybe a light build of Linux on an internal SSD could serve us better here. But the consensus after searching around online is that regardless of what you do, this computer is just very slow in general. It's not to say you can't do nothing on here, I actually could get the notepad up, which runs pretty smooth, and it gave me the opportunity at least to try out the keyboard. While it's certainly less than ideal due to its tight spacing, this keyboard is actually not awful. Sony gave us a pretty comprehensive layout of keys considering the form factor, which does give this a little bit of a pass, though I think what's the most offensive here is the actual key press feel. It is incredibly mushy to type on, so much so that I actually question whether or not I hit certain keys or not. It's a shame that this hardware package is not up to snuff, because the VIOP could have made for a really good media consumption device considering its size. In fact, look to the right of our mouse buttons here and you'll see a button for the cross media bar. This is the exact same interface that Sony liked to put on the PSP, the PS3, this PSX behind me, and a bunch of TVs back in the day, but of course ported over to Windows for the VIOP, as well as other Sony computers. Sadly, I couldn't get it working on this machine, though it would have been awesome to at least experience it a little bit, even if the media playback would have been somewhat sketchy. Circling back to the point that started this video, I understand how profound it might be to call the VIOP one of my favorite laptops ever, given how impractical it is, and especially considering that it costs a whopping $850 when it was new. What the f***? However, what I seriously admire here is what Sony was really going for. When you consider that handhelds like the Steam Deck and way more boutique options like the GPD Pocket are way more common these days, I think that the VIOP's form factor was seriously ahead of its time in a way that the hardware and software of this era couldn't really keep up. Congratulations, you have made it onto our final video on this retrospective super. Cut. And this piece is all about the worst smartphone ever made. Wait till you see the price. Once again, we are traveling back in time to take a look at one of the most disliked smartphones ever made. In this video, I want to talk about what this device is all about, what went wrong with it, and what it's actually like to use in 2024. This right here is the Red Hydrogen One, which you can currently buy on eBay right now for $120. Considering how much 
much these were going for back in the day, this might not be crazy in the scheme of enthusiast novelty pickups, but we'll jump back to value a little later on in the video. First, a little context on this phone, which comes from RED, as in the company that makes these fancy high-resolution video cameras that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Inside that dense metallic brick packs lots of cutting-edge technology to produce the beautiful looking images behind hundreds of Hollywood films and TV shows, including ones you're likely familiar with. However, most famously in our world here on Tech YouTube, Marquez or MKBHD pretty much shot everything on red and still kind of does today. We here at Overclock Media even used this red right here for a couple of years as the primary camera on the Austin Evans channel. But admittedly, more than anything else, owning one of these cameras for your production was absolutely a flex. When you saw one on set, not only did it mean you were cool, but also that you meant business. In many ways, Red was like the Lamborghini of the filmmaking world, and even had the high price tags to back it up. But right at the height of this cinema camera company's success, who again really only had experience selling $50,000 cameras to professionals in the entertainment industry, they had decided that they also had what it takes to release a smartphone for the masses. And thus, the Red Hydrogen One was born. Now this phone, again, you can buy it on eBay for about 120 bucks. But back in the day, this retailed for about 1300, which was absolutely insane, especially when you consider that the flagship iPhone of the time, the 10s Max, retailed for 1100. So, it's not a particularly great start when Red's first and only unproven smartphone was more expensive than mainstay products, and this is not even mentioning the fact that there was a more expensive titanium version which went for 1600. Holy sh**. Now, compared to this iPhone XS, the build quality on the Red Hydrogen One feels absolutely solid. I mean, go figure when this whole thing is made out of machined aluminum and even has some unique design quirks to it. For example, you have these ribbed ridges on the side, which give your fingers a really nice place to rest. This helps add grip when you are holding the phone, especially with one hand. And there's just a lot of textures going on here in general that help add to that confidence inspiring feel. You have more ribbed aluminum on the back, some grippy carbon fiber like material over here as well by the camera. And yeah, this whole thing just feels like a huge chunk of metal, just like the uh, red camera that it takes design cues from. Also, as a bit of an aside, if you guys didn't already know, the guy that founded red also was the founder of the apparel brand Oakley. And if there's anything that these two names have in common, it's that all of the products under them are super manly and all look like weapons of mass destruction. Now, some might argue that this design scheme might seem a bit tacky, but there is a bit of a boyish part of me that absolutely loves this thing purely on the design cues alone. It actually kind of looks badass. Let me know if you think the same way in the comments below. Now, actually turn the Hydrogen One on and you'll find that it is basically a normal Android phone, at least at face value. In terms of specs, it was running flagship stuff for the time, albeit maybe a generation older for when this came out. That's a Snapdragon 835 with six gigs of RAM. And back then it was more than competent. And even now in 2024, it's totally fine. As a media consumption device, the Hydrogen One is pretty darn nice. I do love the fact that the screen is 16 by nine. So for most content, especially on YouTube, you won't get any letterboxing, which is cool. And if I remember correctly, the speakers on this thing were actually solid. Well, statistically speaking, at least half of you are probably watching this very video right now on a phone. I am past Ken. That was a stupid joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Albeit there is some distortion at higher volumes, I do like that the speakers are in the bezels on both left and right so that there's stereo sound coming right at you. However, for me, I think the spec that actually aged the best has to be the battery life. With a 4,500 milliamp hour cell in here, it actually is pretty up to par with today's phones. And in the scheme of something coming from 2018, it absolutely justifies the heck of this device. It is massive, and at least for what that's worth, you do get a big battery inside of here. Most of the stuff that I just talked about, like the SoC, the RAM, battery life, and even the speakers are all normal phone stuff, if I'm being honest. But what really makes the Red Hydrogen One unique has to be this screen. Of course, we just watch normal content on here, but this 5.7 inch 1440p display has a party trick up its sleeve. And that's the fact that it can play 3D content. Now, upon hearing that, some of you might be wondering, how does one get 3D content on this phone in the first place? Back when this phone came out, there were a couple of ways to actually get content that supported this feature. Though sadly, because this phone has been long out of support, these services don't really exist anymore. But thankfully, there were a bunch of videos and pictures on here that were preloaded, presumably to at least demo all of this stuff. Opening up the Red Player app gives us all of these assets. And I'm gonna take a look at this photo of a frog, which looks like it would have decent depth information there. And yeah, there is a 3D depth effect, especially when I start tilting and panning the phone. You know what? I must say that this 3D effect is not as bad as I remember it being. Now, that's not to say it's perfect. It's actually quite far from that. If you move the phone around a lot, if you start pitching it left and right, you do start to hit the limitations of how the 3D layer is on this IPS display. The parallax is there, but it starts to jump around a bit. And honestly, it can look very disorienting might even give you a headache in its worst case scenario. The best way that I'd like to describe this is actually like using a Nintendo 3DS just on steroids. I think the reason why it might work on the Nintendo a little bit better is because you're likely going to see 3D content that's animated and illustrated, where here, when it's an actual real thing, you start to hit that uncanny valley pretty quick with all of the imperfections of the 3D layering of this item. IPS display. Oh man, yeah, you do get a lot of that depth in there. That's so cool. It's a little tacky. Again, I don't want to oversell this, but I also don't want to sell it short either. You do get that depth effect and it is to a degree impressive. Really, this is a single axis phone. You want to plant it down and not move your head around, or you're probably going to get a headache with all of the strobing. It is far from perfect. Now, looking beyond this display, you would think that RED being a camera company, that it would include a competent set of cameras as well. Sadly, that didn't really pan out either. The photos and videos on here are just kind of whatever, which is unfortunate considering that RED is particularly known for their clean images and excellent color science. None of that translates over into these rear-facing cameras though they do allow you to shoot in H.265 and at a 100 megabit data rate, which was a lot better than most other phones at the time. Camera quality and resolution aside, this system is actually set up to also shoot photos and videos in 3D to also take advantage of this 3D display. However, because the camera quality is subpar and outside of the novelty aspect of it, the 3D screen also isn't amazing. I can't imagine anyone would want to really shoot 3D photos and videos on this all that often, but at least they drove the whole ethos of this phone home for what it's worth. 
<laughs> All right, so far with this red hydrogen one, the specs were actually kind of decent. The 3D display was hit and miss, but for the sake of novelty is pretty fun. And the cameras are kind of whatever. But the last piece of the puzzle that really makes this a red phone and really where all of the potential lied was with these gold connectors on the back. Looking back at when red first announced the hydrogen one, they had actually promised a whole ecosystem of add-on accessories that would connect via these pogo pins on the back to maximize the potential of this $1,300 device. In fact, as someone that has shot on red a lot here at Overclock Media, this is something that I'm really familiar with since it's how reds are actually configured. There are pogo pins on the side, top, bottom, all over the camera to configure it any way you want and to use it with Red's ecosystem of accessories. Now, I'm not implying that a lot of the stuff that works with the actual camera will work on the phone, but there was potential for things like an add-on camera attachment that would allow for interchangeable lenses that would outpower what they included on the phone itself, as well as maybe an extended battery module if you were shooting photos with this for an extended period of time, and maybe even something that would allow me to use the excellent screen on the this phone as a monitor for my red camera. But sadly, none of that ever came to fruition. And that's because this phone was pretty much dead on arrival, which is a shame because I spent $1,300 on the Austin Evans credit card and we didn't really get much out of it apart from a video. It's a real shame. It's very easy to say that the Hydrogen One was destined to fail from the get-go, entering into a very competitive smartphone space, but I think it truly failed because it couldn't quite figure out its audience. I remember back in the day, Austin Evans and I actually went to an event for this phone a couple of weeks before launch, and it was very bizarre, mainly because we were probably the only tech-focused people there. There were no tech publications, no journalists, or other tech YouTubers to be seen. But rather, we were invited to this pretty big warehouse venue filled with Hollywood DPs, directors, execs, and actors to celebrate this phone, mingle around, and try out the demo behind closed doors. And back then, I'll tell you, granted it was pre-release, this thing was hot garbage. This event that was void of tech reviewers or people in general that could relay useful information about this device to the general public, as well as the polarizing design of this phone and the brand behind it were heavy indicators that it was targeted towards entertainment industry people over the mainstream crowd. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that Hollywood filmmakers are a hyper-specific demographic of people in the scheme of overall smartphone users. And even so, it's kind of baffling that there wasn't a bigger emphasis on delivering the features that their core customers were expecting. But ultimately, they were never able to deliver on the full potential of what a red phone could and should be. Now, this is going to sound a bit anecdotal, but I think the failure of the Red Hydrogen One could have also played a hand in the company's eventual decline. After all, designing and manufacturing a smartphone isn't easy, especially for a company that hasn't done it before. You got to wonder if the time and resources they put into this product could have been better spent on I don't know, making better cameras? Ultimately, while Red is still kicking around in the film industry, it doesn't quite have the hold on the market like it did six or seven years ago. These days, you see a majority of stuff shot on Sony cameras, the Ari Alexa, and actually Red just got acquired by Nikon of all companies. It is very harsh to say, but perhaps if they kept their focus and stayed in their lane, things might have been better. But at least for how things turned out today, this phone, the Hydrogen One, exists as an interesting relic of smartphone history, and for 120 bucks, it's certainly a neat enthusiast item to grab for your collection. Let me know what you think about this phone in the comments below. And otherwise, thanks for watching this video on Denki Channel.